All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mycology game. Uh, I'm your host, Myco Geeky. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be talking with George Selhorn, PhD, uh, owner and operator of Flourish Labs, and Jordan Jacobs, owner and operator of Trip Labs. Uh, we're going to talk all about HPLC testing for uh, at-home mushroom cultivation. We'll be discussing what HPLC is, how it works, what potential customer should be asking any potential HPLC testing facility, and the ways in which cultivators might be able to best utilize these testing services to help them grow better mushrooms. So a little bit about these guys. Uh, George Selhorn received his PhD in molecular plant sciences and biochemistry from Washington State University. He's been uh, doing liquid chromatography for, you know, about 21 years, uh, 16 years of employment in biomedical science, and has published more than 10 peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals. Uh, he might be a bigger nerd than me. We'll see. In addition, he was the director of a cannabis and environmental testing lab and is thoroughly versed in the accredi accreditation process and running an accredited lab. Now, Jordan Jacobs, he's younger, uh, equally as impressive. He's received his bachelor's of science in chemistry from Humboldt State University, and for the past seven years has worked in analytical chemistry, cannabis extraction, brewing, and mushroom cultivation spaces. Uh, yeah, he's a fun dude. Uh, he's an amateur mycologist and fungal culturist, currently focusing on cultivating species not commonly grown and analyzing them with the tools he has at hand within his network, which, uh, as I have seen on Facebook this summer, uh, he's got a nice network, guys. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome George and Jordan to the show. What's up, guys? Thank you very much, man. That was awesome. Hello. Yeah, thanks for the intro. You got it. All right, so... Uh, we're doing this. We're going to talk about HPLC. It's going to get nerdy, which uh, I always get excited about. Uh, but before we do that, let's spend a little bit of time. I'm going to take you guys one at a time and uh, just give me some background about you guys. Uh, generally speaking, what you want to tell us, I would love to know um, maybe any early connection to mushrooms, uh, you know, personal connection to mushrooms, and then your professional careers as chemists and um, how you sort of ended up where you're at now. So uh, maybe let's do, I got Jordan here first. Let's start with Jordan. All right, I'm going to pull you off, George, for a second. All right, Jordan. Great, um, yeah. Um, so let's start with my personal connection to mushrooms. Um, I've been interested in mushrooms uh, since, gosh, since high school probably. Um, it was sort of that forbidden fruit thing growing up, um, you know, parents, adults around me were like, you know, don't touch it, don't even look at it, it's poisonous. Um, so then, you know, started doodling them and just kind of became fascinated with them. And then when I went to college in Humboldt State University to study chemistry. Um, I, when I lived in the dorms, the, the dorms there are, are tucked into the forest. And so I, when I'd walk to class, I'd be um, finding all kinds of mushrooms on my way to class. Uh, and so it was just sort of interesting to be like, oh, what's this, what's that? I ended up joining the, the Mycological Society, uh, the, hum the um, Humboldt Bay Mycological Society, as well as the, the college mycology club, um, became a member for both of those and just started going on forays and learning about them. And then in chemistry, uh, Humboldt State had a, a decent natural products program um, and there was a professor there, William Wood, uh, that had made some cool discoveries in fungi, um, you know, looking at some of the volatile compounds in uh, different mushrooms that are responsible for the cucumber, farinaceous odor, and some of the, some of the molecules that are, uh, you know, present for the maple syrup curry odor in the candy cap lactarius. Um, Interesting. And so, yeah, I kind of just stumbled down into... You know, it just kept getting better and better and, you know, people like it. So, so a little bit your environment, like the environment was sort of persuading you, it, you know, you, yeah, you had enticements. Selection. Yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and so tell me a little bit about uh, you as a chemist after you got out of Humble, um, you know, what, what were you doing to earn a paycheck? Sure. So, um, you know, after I graduated from the, the chemistry program at Humboldt State, um, I wanted to stick around um, Humboldt because it's got such a beautiful natural environment. And uh, one of the few 
uh, chemistry jobs you can get there because there's not very much industry in Arcata um, was environmental analytical chemistry. Um, so I got hired at a small little mom and pop lab um, doing environmental testing, looking at contaminants in soil and water. Um, and they had just started a separate branch doing some cannabis analysis. Um, so I helped a little bit there with, with sample preparation um, and helped do um, some stuff for cannabis extract uh, headspace gas chromatography, um, which looks at the, the volatile fraction of um, samples. So basically you put like a little extract in a vial and you close the vial and you warm it up and whatever kind of comes off into the air, the needle will come and only pull the air out and inject it and look at that. And so I worked there for a while. Unfortunately, I took a, um, a pre-planned trip to Japan and they didn't like that so much. So they laid me off, but um, you know, whatever. I had to go to Japan. So I came back and uh, got into the cannabis industry. I did a little bit of like manufacturing of um, THC and um, you know, other, you know, cannabinoids and terpenes. Uh, mostly, you know, naturally extracted. I did that for a while, and then I switched industries. And I got into brewing, and I was a lab technician. Uh, kind of worked my way up to lab manager, but small lab, so depends who's calling it. But um, doing quality assurance, quality control, um, alcohol percentage in beers, uh, hops concentration, uh, beer color yeast counts, microbial contamination. So all that sort of brewing science stuff, I did that for a little bit. Um, and yeah. And then okay, okay. So, so, so how do you go from that to I'm going to buy an HPLC machine and I'm going to start testing uh, the potency and uh, other various molecules sure, sure. And, and mushrooms? So actually, um, when I moved to Portland... I met um, someone that was interested in getting uh, HPLC testing set up for um, like basically getting a mushroom method going. And so I got hired by this guy to work under the table um, to basically get this, this method set up. And not uh, literally under the table though. He let you work above the table, but you, okay, I get it. Sorry. <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's interesting times. So basically, he's a cannabis lab, and the cannabis labs kind of have their hands tied because one regulatory body says that they they can test mushrooms right now in the decriminalized space, and the other regulatory body says they can't. And so um, it depends how fine of a line you want to walk. Um, and so we kind of were developing what basically we were able to develop the method offsite, um, and so that there's no actual uh, psilocybin or any sort of fungi right. entering the cannabis testing facility. So I did that for a while, um, and then an opportunity came up to get um, my own, and uh, I've kind of always wanted to be like a small business owner. So, so let me um, guess, you were yard sailing one Saturday morning, <laughs> and right next to the um, the Easy Bake Oven, it was you could get the Easy Bake Oven for a dollar, or you could get a new HPLC, uh, great condition for twenty grand. And that was an easy choice because those easy bake, I'm still cooking a batch of cookies from my easy bake oven as a child. Those suck. Anyway. Oh, man. Yeah, I've ordered for it. They called that I, two chickens and a goat. I mean, so is it just because you're a chemist and you're, you guys are just slinging gear around all the time? Or I mean, how, like, how do you just hear about an HPLC machine? I'm curious how There's that happens. Options and stuff, but yeah, I had. A chemist friend, actually. Who so, kind of knew one was coming up, like, hey, my boss is downgrading or buying a new Tesla yeah. HPLC machine and he's selling his Nissan. Yeah, exactly. I get it. Cool. Yeah, Tesla, he trades in the Corolla. There you go. So, okay, so you're up and running. You you have, a, you know, a physical location where you're doing this so you can get all your standards and do all your tests. How long have you been doing this for now? I've um, been doing mushroom testing now for uh, about a year and a half. Nice. Um, including what I did for um, my previous boss. 
Gotcha. Okay. Okay, man. Well, I appreciate that. I'm going to segue over to George. We're going to do the same thing with him. And then when we come back, we're going to um, get into specifically what is it so you guys can kind of tag team and tell everybody what HPLC really is so they have a better understanding of, uh, you know, why it doesn't cost $5 to test, basically. Yeah. All right. So so we're I'm going to switch over here one second. All right, George, your turn. All right. I want the history. Okay, so uh, the way I got interested in psychedelics and mushrooms was uh, I was about 14 or 15. I got introduced to cannabis, and um, it made a huge impact on me, uh, really helped me deal with some stuff that I dealt with when I was younger, the anger issues and some stuff like that. And then short time after that, um, I got introduced to LSD and uh, hit that pretty hard my junior year of high school and had a tremendous impact on my future actually because i was uh hanging out with a bunch of people let's just put it this way three of my four best friends at the time are dead or and the other one's in uh, prison so okay. um, i was going down a bad a bad path probably and i started experimenting with lsd and i just had all of these things come to light and realize that i was selling myself short and i could do a lot more with my life than party and you know skateboard even though i love skateboarding i'm still a skateboarder and i will be until the day i die um love skateboarding actually also helped me get away and out out of all that stuff and uh so uh i got introduced to mushrooms in college so shortly after uh going to college i got introduced to mushrooms at a fish show actually and uh tried that and um the experience was so much different for me than LSD. And, uh, it was actually a lot more profound and it scared me at the time, to be honest, Mm -hmm. because, uh, I had gone through about two years of basically abusing psychedelics as a kid. And, uh, although it did get me to a good place, um, I just, when I took mushrooms a couple of times, I was like, Oh, this is too much for me. I don't need to do this right now. So then I didn't do anything for quite a while and I got down on the academic track. Um, so went to college, um, didn't even really know what I wanted to do. Like I was going to be a professional skateboarder. I had a couple of friends that went pro. I was right there at the level where if I had dedicated my life to it, I probably could have done it and probably end up broken and, and broke right, right. now. Um, so fortunately I, uh, I did, I went to college and got interested in chemistry right off the bat. That was super interesting interesting to me. It was easy. Like it just all made sense. And then I uh, transferred to Indiana university because I was at ball state university in Muncie, Indiana. Funny story. Like I wasn't even planning on going to college. So when I decided to go, it was the only school in the state accepting applications. So I went there and at the time, my girlfriend, actually, she was trying to get into Indiana university or St. Mary's, which is basically the sister school to Notre Dame. And the uh, secretary at our high school didn't send her transcripts. So she had to apply last minute to Ball State as well. So we ended up going there, transferring oh, nice. to Indiana University a couple of years later. Um, and uh, as a chemistry student, I really wasn't getting the attention I wanted, you know, uh, from professors and the, the department and all of that. They were very heavily uh, focused on their graduate program. So I got a little disenchanted and ended up switching to just biology. So I ended up, uh, then I went down the plant route and I've been a very constant and what some people would probably consider heavy cannabis user since I was about 15, pretty much 30 years of daily use. And, uh, um, it's been a tremendous help for me. Like I said, uh, I went really down the rabbit hole. I've been a grower ever since I was 15. I tried to get into the uh, recreational cannabis stuff because I did, in parallel to all my professional career, I was working in the medical cannabis space up near Seattle, working with CBD. I was pretty sure I was the first person in the country to isolate a hemp plant in 2010 from the Mr. Nice Seed Bank uh, and uh, resin seeds collaboration. I was the only person from the test group that got anything tested and lab tested. And I had a pure hemp plant. And uh, so that was, I sent that to lots of people all over the country, people in Colorado. I wouldn't be surprised if a major percentage of the hemp plants in this country are hybridized of of that plant, especially the old ones. And so, you know, I was, while I was working in uh, my professional career, which I'll get to in a second, I was always had my one foot in the counterculture 
you know, working in that side and always wanting, I almost opened a cannabis lab. Actually, I had a couple friends in about 2010 or 11 telling me I should open up a lab. And I was early in my academic and uh, biotech career. And I just thought, no, I'm just going to do it. I went and got this PhD. Let's, let's use it. And, you know, the whole reason why I started doing science and especially biomedical science is I wanted to do something to help people. Uh, my mom right. was bipolar, had a lot of mental health issues. And so I grew up with that right adjacent to me. And I always wanted to help people with those kind of disorders. And, uh, I've been doing biotech for 20 years and it's nothing but a giant waste of time and money. If you ask me, it's, I mean, there's definitely some pharmaceuticals out there that are useful, but for the most part, it's a huge money pit. It's a massively stressful industry. You aren't appreciated. Uh, you're just basically a number that gets cycled in and out. And it's, it's tremendously frustrating. I don't feel like I've done anything to help any patients in 20 years. Um, I've helped lots of yeah. professors get grants. I've helped them companies get money, but you know, that's very unsatisfying. Right. And so, um, a couple of years ago, I had a couple friends, I guess about a year and a half now, a couple friends say, you know, this mushroom thing is blowing up. You should start a lab. And I just basically was like, oh, I made this mistake once. I'm not going to do this again. So I started shopping for a machine, started researching all the methods. And once I realized how, relatively easy it would be to do alkaloid testing i was all in you know i went and uh invested in the machinery the 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 reagents i started spending time doing method development and all this sort of thing and then the last september uh i bought everything and then by january 1st flourish labs was open and testing um and then over that period of time, I've developed a uh, five alkaloid test for uh, fruiting body, uh, gummies, extracts, and chocolates. So I can test all of those products and uh, five alkaloids. I'm going to be adding originacin soon. And I'm nice. Sure Pronounce that right. Now, where, now you have a, you have somebody who can get that as a standard for you or you have a company? Oh, I can get them. Yeah, my company okay. can get all of cool. them. Um, so, you know, one mig per mil, one mil, uh, one mil standards are DEA exempt, which is why pretty much anybody with a lab space can order them. So that's kind of like the history of how I got into the mushroom testing and also nice. the, the psychedelics. And so for like the last four years, I've been microdosing and that has, uh, I'm going to be very frank here, man. I, I've dealt with a lot of anger issues over my life. It's been a huge problem. And uh, the combination of microdosing breath work uh, and cold exposure Wim Hof method uh, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has allowed me to get a uh, very much nice. better control over those emotions. And uh, so it's, it's all three of those things that I practice pretty much regularly to, uh, you know, help, help me keep my, my mind right. And I, I live I a really you. stressful life. You know, I, I, my wife is a stay at home mom and we homeschool our kids. So everything is on me to pay the bills. And, you know, it's, I've, which I can pay the bills pretty easily, but I also want to be happy. And I've had right. a hard time reconciling my professional career and my happiness, you know, because I've lost huge chunks of time from my daughter, uh, during her development. And, uh, you know, it's, it's stuff you can't get back. So what I'm yeah. trying to do now is focus all my energy towards Flourish Labs, work for myself, uh, eventually leave the traditional biotech industry and uh, move on to 100% uh, into the mushroom world. Because I'm also testing, uh, I won't talk too much about this because I know it's outside the scope of the podcast, but I'm expanding into all functional and medicinal mushrooms. I have a cordyceps method. I'm working on glucan testing now. I'll be doing the reishi development test next. And of course the golden ticket is lion's mane, but um, you know, I'm going to need a mass spec for that because that one is uh, not amenable to exclusively HPLC testing and the standards. For well, just ask mane. Jordan what uh, yard sale he went to. And yeah, you're talking yeah. tens of thousands of dollars yeah. for, for a simple mil couple milligrams of standard. So I'm actually looking into yeah. try to start making them and purifying them myself, which will lean on my background of, uh, you know, protein and nice. small molecule purification. And, uh, okay. So I'm going to wrap up my, uh, my, my academic and biotech background really quick. Um, so I went to college on a whim, 
uh, ended up getting a bachelor's of science uh, in biology from Indiana University in 99. I took a year off waiting for that girlfriend of mine to graduate. I went out to Pullman, Washington in the uh, is you, it was the Institute of Biological Chemistry, Plant Physiology Department, which became the Molecular Plant Sciences Department when mm-hmm. I was there and got my PhD in 2006, moved to Seattle and worked as an, uh, at the Seattle Biomedical Research Institute doing an HIV vaccine discovery project for five years. Then I went into my first uh, industry job, uh, which a company called Alizine, which is working on pegylated interferon, antibody drug conjugates, uh, bifunctional antibodies and pegylated bifunctionals, uh, some really high tech stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and then uh, I actually dipped into the cannabis industry for a little while. I got hired by actually Dutch Master Nutrients to work on their nutrients and they actually had a license, but that never worked out. They kind of fizzled out. Um, and I went back into biotech for a little bit and then opened my own consulting gig, helped people with uh, cannabis analytics and extractions. Uh, I worked with a CBD company in Seattle for many years, uh, product development, um, cult- helping them with cultivation. I've also done large scale consulting in cannabis cultivation product development, extractions, and then uh, worked at Rose City Labs where I was a director for a little while. And uh, now I'm working at a biotech company called Absci where I do downstream process development, uh, which is protein purification and stuff like that. Mm. So um, always had one foot in the counterculture door, always wanted to jump in, but had this really, really big issue of outing myself for fear of losing my biotech job, uh, which uh, at this point... um, I'm all in on the mushroom stuff. And if I lost my biotech job, I wouldn't cry. I'd actually um, just roll the punches and head on over to the mushroom lab more. Because right now, to be honest, I only get to put about 10 hours a week into Flourish. And uh, it's not enough to develop, do the testing development and run samples and do all the QC and have a full-time day job and be a parent, be a husband and all that other things. And I used to live in Hillsboro. So I was commuting two hours a day to work, but oh I just moved to, to Vancouver and now I bike to work. And so nice. um, I'm going to take this, uh, I'm done here, but I'm going to take this opportunity to, to announce uh, uh, I've been uh, hired as a psilocybin professor to work oh. at one of the schools that is going to be training therapists and it's called Sunset Psilocybin. And if anybody is interested in early enrollment, please call 503-888-8849. And thank you so much for letting me do that quick plug. Nice. Uh, I'll be sure to add that into the description tomorrow. Uh, That's pretty cool, man. I've been talking to a lot of people um, in the space and, uh, you know, we all grow them and that's where our love is. But man, uh, I, I don't think there's one person that grows them that doesn't understand the value of the, the therapeutic component, getting the set and setting right. And, and kind of, I always tell people the, the mushroom is like the gas for your, like you're the car, the mushrooms, the gas, the therapy is is the road. So you, if you don't have the therapy, you're just a car with gas, just sitting in the (laughs) fucking driveway going nowhere, which is great when you're 18 years old and trying to have fun, but yeah. Right. Anyway, that's, that's very cool. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to pull Jordan back in, and uh, we're going to move on to uh, the core initial thing, which is what the hell for the, you know, we're, none of us are as nerdy as you guys are. You guys are playing with really expensive toys. I I would love to play with it. I would probably fucking break them. Um, so why don't you guys start super simple? I don't know who wants to start off, but... Just super Go ahead, simple. I just spent some time talking. What is HPLC? Um, start off in a nutshell and then kind of evolve into a more sophisticated understanding of it. And, and if you guys need slides, just let me know. I'll pull the slides up. Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I hear you. Great. Great. Uh, yeah. HPLC, it's an abbreviation for high performance liquid chromatography. Uh, it's kind of a long mumble of words, but I the I think the best way to start is to start with chromatography, which is mm-hmm. the science of the separation of components in in a mixture. Is that like so? When I was a kid, I remember in junior high, 
we had this this paper and we would set it in a dish and then stuff would sort of suck up into the paper and the colors. Yeah. That's the yeah. super basic that's, idea, right? Yeah, that's that's okay. where it all really started. Is paper. That's how it got its name. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you separated so, a sample into different colors and it's paper, and then the chromatography chromo. came from the colors that separated yep. out. Yep. Okay. Cool. Exactly. So it's, sorry, I, I had to go back to junior high there for a second, guys. No, I think it's a great analogy to have uh, for the listeners um, because okay. it's a really relatable thing, and it's and it really is. It started as like a visual, um, you know, visually seeing. You know, let's say you start with something brown, and all of a sudden it wicks up, and you have blues and mm -hmm. greens, and yellows, or whatever the whole um, color spectrum. And so that's that's uh, the basic principle behind the technology. Now, liquid meaning that the the uh, chromatography is happening in the liquid phase. Um, in, and in liquid chromatography, basically what's going on is you have your mixture is dissolved in a liquid and it's going, um, it, and the liquid is called a mobile phase. And the mobile phase okay. is passed through um, a, a, what's called a stationary phase, which is basically these solid particles. And so the equivalent to go back to, to my analogy, the so, the stationary phase would be the paper from junior high school. The paper is the, the mobile phase, phase is the dish of whatever. Okay. Correct. And so basically the the um, the two different dynamics that are happening there is uh, how soluble or how much do the molecules in the mixture like the mobile phase and how um, how easily retained or um, you know how like are they to the stationary phase. Um, and so, and, and those two factors, along with a couple other things in the HPLC, um, determine uh, how these individual components separate from okay. the mixture. And I imagine, so one of the phases, whether it's the mobile phase or the stationary phase, one, one phase probably has a polarity to it, causing things to stay by it versus... Or vice versa, right? Yeah, it, it there's both that's, ways. That's, go ahead, George. Yeah, there's two different uh, sort of concepts there. There's uh, <clears throat> what's called reverse phase, and that's when you're using a stationary phase that's very hydrophobic and binds to hydrophobic molecules. And okay. You use actually salt or no salt to get it off, and then actually with the alkaloids, we don't use that. It's just a change in the mobile phase and the aqueous portion. Um, and then if you can use, I actually use hillock, which is hydrophilic interaction and reverse phase is also called hydrophobic interaction. So that's the opposite where the stationary phase is very well interacting with aqueous molecules. And so it's kind of, they kind of function in reverse, like a reverse phase one will retain more hydrophobic columns longer and the less hydro or the more hydrophilic column, uh, analytes will come out first and then in a hydrophilic column you will have more hydrophobic ones come out first and the more aqueous uh hydrophilic ones interact with the phase of the of the column more so they're they both work and they're both adequate it just depends on what you want to do i prefer hillock because alkaloids are water soluble and you can manipulate and control the retention times a lot better than in a reverse phase system with an aqueous molecule i mean the retention times meaning as it's being pulled through there where everything starts sitting yeah if you have my slide that i gave you i can illustrate that real quick for everybody okay this one yeah, so this is uh, five standards of uh, mixed together in a complex mixture. Uh, silicin, norcilicin, psilocybin, baocystin, and norbaocystin. They're all at an equal concentration of 125 nanograms per microliter. And when you inject it, they're obviously all mixed together in the solution. And they mm -hmm. pass through the column. And you can see that first peak and valley. That's actually the methanol that the samples were in that is okay. different from the mobile phase. So that's just a, uh, it's called a, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the, the, solvent front. the solvent front. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and so you can see silosin comes out first, nor silosin second. And these molecules, uh, for example, just to make this really easy. Psilocybin is the phosphorylated version of that alkaloid, right? It has an extra phosphate and three oxygens on it. That makes it more water soluble. When you lose 
uh, yeah, right there's the phosphate. And when you lose the phosphate, which what happens in our gut and enzymatically to produce silosin, you lose some water solubility. And you see these rings. These are actually very hydrophobic. It's very polar molecule except for the, uh, I mean, uh, non-polar molecule except for the OH and the two amines. So you add that phosphate on there and it dissolves in aqueous solutions much better. So if you go back to the other one, that's why you'll see silosin coming out first on the hillock column compared to the, oh, that's actually backwards. What am I, I, I saw so you, I was, <laughs> okay. Uh, so the more water soluble are retained on the column as opposed to the less, so I'm sorry, I actually flipped that. I, I you know, I, Jordan, I actually saw your face like make a little bit of a look. I was like, am I getting that backwards? Did you notice that I was saying that backwards? I thought oh, you that. did. Uh, if you, if I do that again, you do notice, call me out, man. So, so you're saying yeah. just to, to go over it again for the viewers, the highlight chromatography, um, the the stationary phase retains the hydrophilic analytes longer, and that's why you see psilocybin biocystin and norbiocystin coming out after psilocin and norcilocin because they have that phosphate group and because they're they're more hydrophilic. Yeah. So now let me just ask you guys. So I know there's this tube of silica beads or what, whatever the media is for the stationary phase. And then you, there's a degasser and injector, which we can get into all that, but basically you're injecting it into a solvent as it's passing through. Yep. That pretty, I'm sure that's cheap. Um, One of our shiny toys. Yeah. They're like $700. It's yeah. Toy. No big deal. It's very like anticlimactic for, for how pricey it is, uh, but at least it's shiny. Shiny's good. So you're, you're pumping it through this, uh, you, you know, homogenized, uh, like George was saying, you put all the standards into, into a bowl, shook it up in a, in a ninja blender and then dumped it in, into the machine. So as little bits of this is passing through, some of it is more likely to very rapidly um, have affinity for the stationary phase or have a more affinity for the mobile phase. Am I getting this right? So that like norbeocystin at the end, that, that, am I saying this right? That would be more likely to have liked the mobile phase. The Meaning it took phase. long. Oh, it, it's oh, sticking, okay. so it's the, sticking more and coming out later. And another analogy okay. to, to think about for this is if you have like a, you know, like that Plinko game that was on the prices, yeah. right? I might be aging mm -hmm. myself here. So if you could imagine that you had two different size Plinko chips and you drop them in, the bigger one is going to take longer to go through. Uh, and the okay, smaller sure. one's going to fall through really quickly. And so that's actually a concept of a, of a, HPLC method called size exclusion chromatography. So it's based mm -hmm. on size and shape, not chemistry. No. Whereas this, what's driving it is the chemistry interaction between the analyte and the stationary phase. Got it. All right. Okay. So let's pull up. That makes sense. Let's pull this one up here. Uh, Jordan was kind enough, uh, to save me from, uh, uh, stealing somebody else's uh, slides here. So he, he has a nice little slide that kind of walks through this. So let's use this, guys, to sort of walk through a day in the life of a sample destined for one of your guys' HPLC machines. Yeah, so this is um, just a simplified kind of shape flow diagram of the process of um, HPLC analysis of really anything but mushrooms in this instance. Any, and uh, so it starts off in the top left corner. Um, you know, the, you take the mushrooms, they're dehydrated. Um, the dehydrated mushrooms are then homogenized and extracted in some appropriate solvent. Um, those extracts are then filtered and usually diluted, and that becomes your sample. And then the, the um, column of, of shapes in the middle is representative of the HPLC and there's an actual HPLC um, to the right there. So you have the mobile phase, which is those bottles on top with the solvent. You have the solvent pump. Um, <clears throat> then you have the injector, um, which introduces the sample and mixes it with the, the mobile phase. And those go together and they move uh, to the column. 
And then basically what the, the colored blobs in the column show is you, you start with that brown mixture and the individual components start to separate from each other as uh, seen in um, whatever you want to call that color, fuchsia and uh, mm -hmm. cooked salmon. And then you, uh, as they travel further down the column, they get separated into thinner bands as individual components. Um, they then leave the column and they go on the way to the final part of the stack, which is the detector. Um, in my instance, I use an ultraviolet or visible light absorbance detector. Um, and then that data, which is basically um, electrical signals, gets uh, transferred to a computer and the computer uh, plots that data for you in some data acquisition software. And that's where you actually get the, the chromatograph. Um, so, so the light portion, so once the, the column has separated the, the components uh, of the solution out, the point at which you're using the light to then measure these, these peaks, is that occurring still within that column or is that occurring past the column? It occurs past the column. So okay. you have, um, so this is a UV vis detector, ultraviolet slash uh, visible light detector. Um, and this sort of detector only works for molecules that absorb light. Um, right. And so the actual peak on the chromatograph in the bottom right, those, those sharp little peaks, are um, that's actually the molecule passing by like a little flow cell. There's basically like some light shining in this flow cell. And as the molecule passes it, the, uh, the detector on the other side of the light is no longer seeing any light because the molecule is absorbing it. And mm -hmm. so it's a millivoltage potential difference. So that gets plotted on the computer as like, um, you know, difference okay. from the baseline, essentially. And so, and then as it, as it leaves, as the molecule leaves the flow cell, um, you know, you're back to baseline and the, the light is hitting the detector as normal. Um, so you're getting the normal millivolt readout. Yeah, the raw okay. data is what's called an absorbance readout. And it's usually like an A220. So that's like the absorbance and then at the specific wavelength. So 220 is what I use. Uh, I use a DAD and then a common wavelength for proteins is 280 nanometers. And I believe for uh, cordyceps, I use like 254, which is where nucleotide nucleosides absorb. So it, different classes of molecules absorb at different wavelengths. And that's also one way to exploit um, the ability to detect these things in complex molecules or a complex solution. So, so you just said, uh, Jordan, you just said that um, obviously only molecules that can absorb light. What would be an example of a molecule that's not absorbing, absorbing light? Hmm. So Sorry. That's a, <laughs> that's, that's there's a quiz a, question. Yeah. It's basically like a class of compounds, right? So if you put okay. up um, one of, oh, actually there, if you just either slow and psilocybin, anything you can put up there. Um, sure. There are, in the, so you see these six member ring with two set yep. or three sets of double bonds. That's called mm -hmm. a benzene ring. Yeah. And benzene ring. whenever you see molecules that have rings with double bonds, these are typically the type that absorb various wavelengths of light. And so okay. if you get a molecule that's a mu much more simple, doesn't have these complex uh. bonds, complex bonds, then they won't absorb. And then also there's varying like magnitudes of absorbance. Some molecules absorb mm. a lot more light than others. So there's these variable variability in, in how you can detect things based on sensitivity as well. Right. So quick question, water, does it absorb light or, cause it's simple, right? It's oxygen, Correct. two hydrogens. Does no, it? it doesn't, it doesn't absorb it, visible light. No. Okay. So there really has to be that complexity of the benzene ring or multiple rings or then really complex protein structures, stuff like Double that. Double bonds, it, triple bonds. Right. Uh, so some, like there's. <laughs> okay. So, so, organic compounds as a general rule will be absorbing light and can be read on HPLC. Uh, that's a good general way to put it. Okay. Yeah. There's, I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions, a, yeah. but yeah, sure. that's a good way okay. to put it. Like I wanted to test muscarin, which is a, um, a, one of the deadly toxins produced by some fungi. Yeah. And uh, that one is not very um, susceptible to testing via hmm. uh, diode array detection. So now is that, 
Xbox. It's not susceptible for the HPLC machine you have, or in general, uh, it's a hard one to test could, for. You could test it with HPLC mass spec, okay. um, maybe other methods, but it, it doesn't really show up on a... Uh, okay. with the yeah. That's where the mass spec really comes in as like the ultimate tool for this kind of work because mm -hmm. mass specs can be used in a couple different ways. They can be used to identify compounds if you have access to an expensive database, or they can sure. be used to quantitate things if you have standards. But if there's no standard that exists, um, you can still identify it as long as it's present in a database. And so that's okay. why the mass spec becomes so powerful for investigating new compounds. And see, one thing yeah. that they can also do is like they can detect compounds. And if it's not even in your database, then you might have discovered a new compound and then you have to go through this other sort of mechanism of identification, NMR spectroscopy, all these other tools that you can use to identify unknown compound structures. And I mean, realistically, that's going to happen in the space eventually. I mean, we've surely not discovered all the, the, the stuff in these mushrooms, right? I mean, a hundred percent. This works, yeah. this works already being done overseas. Okay. I know of at least one lab that uh, is working really hard on this stuff. So um, we'll see. So subscribing, it's not like a Netflix subscription. It's you, like how expensive to get access to this data. If you say I have a mass spec, like then what's my additional uh, cost? I think it's like something like 30 grand. Oh, okay. But I mean, so, if I can buy a mass spec, I can probably pay that. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Well, yeah. yeah. But a lot, but a lot still. And, um, you can pay to use a mass spec at a university and you can actually okay. pay to get trained. I think you get, you got to pay hourly for the training. Okay. Um, and then you can pay per sample. Um, but then the thing is you're going to get hit with this, you know, as far as like unknown small molecule discovery, um, one chromatograph from a, a untargeted, um, you know, ion mobility mass spec is that's, that's a year's worth of work going through. Yeah, it's and, it's huge. And then yeah, even okay. after you get all that data, um, you know, you have to go back and basically build up a lot of biomass and do specialized chromatography to try to isolate. Well, you got to validate it. Yeah, it's it's, it's like so it's a years it's more R and D. Yeah, Definitely it goes happen. back to the famous saying: "Science is hard." <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and all these great things that, I mean, I was just watching a podcast the, uh, a couple nights ago, um, some uh, AI computer software dude interviews all these smart guys in, in science and biotech and all this stuff. And he's interested in the merging of, um, you know, uh, medicine, biotech with AI and how, uh, how biology is going to inform AI tech and how AI might inform future biological uh, stuff. And it was just fascinating and simultaneously like, oh, my God, everyone needs to start, uh, you know, digging it, digging their kids into these STEM programs because we're going to need a lot of fucking people doing this work. But if we get a lot of people doing this work, we're going to probably figure out some pretty, pretty astounding things. Uh, yeah, the company exciting. I work for is actually using AI to design, you know, molecules for drug discovery. Wow. I, I recently saw something on a Vice News where they said they had finally modeled the, the receptor, the serotonin with S2H, I forget what receptor uh, psilocybin binds to. But they said they successfully modeled it accurately. And because they did that, they could then ch chug it through a software. And they said, oh, yeah, so we figured out there are 32 million possible synthetic molecules that could theoretically bind to this. And I'm like, oh, cool. Well, only 32 to figure out which the, you know, right one for PTSD is and the right one for uh, mild uh, social anxiety. And yeah, you're right. You know, because what you're doing there is these receptors there, a lot of them aren't just pure on off switches. They can be right. like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There? Modulated. Like regulated or, or modulated yeah, by a yeah. certain molecule, a certain amount of that molecule. Yep. Or like there's complicated interactions of inhibition by other molecules that sometimes will prevent oh, yeah. receptors. Or there's all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's so cool to be at this stage where all this information is starting to come out. And we're really um, at 
really the beginning of uh, technically not the beginning because there was some amazing work done in the late 50s and early 60s uh, on some of this stuff. Not necessarily the sophisticated receptor stuff, but at least you yeah. know dosing patients. The groundwork. Yeah, so it's yeah. really exciting to be a part of this. I um, can't wait to see what comes from all this work in the next few years. And most importantly is the ability to help people. And one of the most important things to me is helping our veterans because yeah, man, I don't even want to go down this road, how angry I get when I think about how this country treats our veterans and how everything, all the freedoms and the lax life that most people have in this country is a hundred percent result of these people going over and giving their lives and, and, and not even people that pass away, but people that come back and have their, their worlds wrecked, you know, like at, at the Portland psychedelic society, there was a gentleman there that was a special forces guy and the stories he told were unbelievable. And the amount of, uh, yeah therapy he's had to go through with Bufo and stuff to, to end up where he's at. But it's right. Remarkable. Only after being prescribed way too much Oxycontin and, and oh, all that was, from the VA. Yeah, yeah. He had a hundred percent. He was a, he had addiction issues from all those things yeah. and, and uh, the toad and he was just, the toad saved him. Yeah. I like toads. Uh, okay. So I, I think that gives everybody kind of a, a basic understanding. Now we're going to move into a little bit more sophisticated discussion about um, try to educate viewers about some specifics so that they can better talk to a potential lab that they might want to do business with. So let's, let's start off talking. We've sort of begun to reference them, um, but let's talk about all the alkaloids that you guys can test for in a given uh, uh, active mushroom. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, what is it, seven um, that are commercially available. As far, you know, when you say active, that really uh, throws Sorry, out. did I throw you? Okay. Any commercially mushroom available. that happens yeah. to have. We only really have proof that uh, one of them is active. That's psilocin. That's uh, true. Right. So... Well, we do want that in in our in our. Yeah, assets. psilocybin is basically considered a pro drug, is what it's called. Something that's modified by the body before it comes at right. comes active. So I just pulled this up because this I think this is Jordan's, and I believe these are some Zabaticorum. Um, yes, but this but this shows some of the stuff you're you're testing for the alkaloids. This is some of the stuff that I do readily, and um, that's easy for me to do for people. Um, and it's just the, the three, uh, it's the one major and two minor components I see, or maybe two minor or sorry, two major and one minor, depend on who you talk to, um, psilocybin, psilocin and baocystin. So, um, you know, the, the phosphorylated tryptamines are, are, um, you know, really the, the molecules that the, the mushrooms are, are making in the pathway. Um, and then, you know, they get degraded in psilocin and in the live mushroom, those uh, quickly get converted into um, psilocin oligomers, which is that blue color that you see. Oh, Anyways, okay. this is um, uh, a chromatograph with, with those three. Um, and so you can see psilocybin is a major component of the extract. Uh, this is a methanolic extract of dry fruits. Um, and then the, so that, and then the bottom left is, so basically I, zoomed in on the on the chromatograph and I deleted the psilocybin peak out. So now all you're seeing is baocystin and psilocin. Okay. Uh, because otherwise there'd just be a giant blob there for psilocybin. It would be as visually pleasing. Um, and then the three figures on the right are um, the diode array detector. So basically um, these are UV vis spectra of the three molecules and, and they're all the same relatively because they're uh, all have that indol backbone, and like George was saying earlier, that's that's really mm-hmm. what's responsible for the absorbance of light. Um, and so, and the, the 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 what's nice about the diode ray detector is you get sort of um, a spectral fingerprint, um, and so you can look at the peak, and you can um, you can click on the peak, and it'll show you uh, the the full spectrum of what is coming out during that peak time, and so you can really make sure that what you're seeing is um, not having any like coelution issues, at least any major coelution issues with other right. um, small molecules that might be throwing off your quantitation. Um, so those now, are the- so, so real quick, let me, uh, I, I want to clarify this just 
for everybody, just so that there's complete clarity. Psilocybin in the mushroom, as soon as I ingest it, my body is immediately trying to convert it to psilocin. Did I say that correctly? Trying to is like kind of personifying your body a little bit. Mm -hmm. but, it, it, um, it is. That's what it's. It, it's happening. Yeah. Yeah, it's happening. And, and, and that's mushroom, so it's not only your body, but it's also the mushroom because you're macerating it with your teeth, and those sure. enzymes, those dephosphorylation enzymes are active, and so the mushroom is okay. doing it. So now to cross the blood-brain barrier, um, does it have to convert from psilocybin to psilocin, or do both of those molecules cross? Most likely, yes. There was a paper that just came out that theorized uh, part of why psilocin is orally active versus something like DMT. Um, mm. And basically what happens is uh, if you pull up the, the psilocin structure, I can show sure, you. Sure, yeah. Um, so, so the psilocybin psilocin. So the um, the amine tail that's that the the chain with the NH on the right. Um, yep. Actually, kind of um, in you know when it's you know these things are not rigid. They 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 wiggle around, and um, it actually sort of flips around and and hydrogen bonds with that um, OH group, the hydroxyl group. Oh, and okay. Hydrogen bonding is not like a it's not a um, connective bond like a covalent bond, so it wouldn't it's be like, like hanging a, out. It wouldn't it's the way water bond. sticks together. Yeah, right. they're drawn together, um, and, and they kind of become sticky right there. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's probably that um, that allows it to uh, cross. It's that sort of interaction that allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's not as prickly. Yeah. It's kind of a little slipperier. Yeah, right. Well, charged molecules don't go across the blood-brain barrier, right? Say that yeah. again? I said I don't think charged molecules go across the oh, blood-brain okay. so barrier, the... which is why... When okay. the NH reaches over and interacts with the water, it's like a, it's a very transient bond, but it, but it, it does, it takes away the charge and it probably allows it to go. It's like sucking in your gut, trying to sneak into stuff. a concert. <laughs> yeah, I get it. That's what I have to do. All right. So, um, so sorry, I, I sort of threw us off there a minute, but I wanted to make sure, I think a lot of people, I hear that talked about a lot, the, the psilocybin to psilocin and, and uh, wanted to just take it back to junior high again there for a minute. Okay, so let me pull back up this, uh, um, what slide did I have up? Was it this one? Yeah, yes, okay, sorry. Up, but um, if you want, I don't know what else I was gonna say here. Um, there also is another slide of something I'm working on still. It's the, I think it's the seven. Oh, okay. Hold on. Tryptamine. This one? Yeah. So okay. this is like the possible plethora of, of mod mushroom tryptamines, uh, that can be tested for. And then there's some precursors to these two, like, you know, there's tryptophan and tryptamine, tryptamine okay, being right. on phosphorylated norbeocystin. Um, yeah, and there's also tryptophan decarbox, uh, tryptophan carboxylic acid or tryptamine carboxylic acid. I forget which one. There's a couple of others, um, that could be on and supposedly paniolus has serotonin as well. Um, so it's possible that could be added on. Uh, I just had someone ask me if I could test for serotonin. I was wondering why, but that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yes. There's some reports that. of Paniolus having serotonin. I don't actually have the primary literature source on that, so I don't know the validity of it, but I've heard that before. Um, and, but yeah, here is um, reverse phase. So going back to like talking about the, um, the stationary phase setup, this is the opposite of Georgia's setup. So basically um, the, the hydrophilic things come off first because my stationary phase is hydrophobic. So the molecules okay. that are very hydrophilic don't have a lot of interaction time um, with, with the stationary. Column. Right. Okay. Um, and so that's why in this one versus George's norbeocystin, baocystin, originacin, and psilocybin, all the phosphorylated ones are coming off first. Gotcha. And then you have, um, you know, the non-phosphorylated psilocin, norcilocin, and 4-hydroxy trimethyltryptamine. And what's the other name for that 4-HO? Isn't there another? 
No, there's no name for it. There is not. Okay. We. How about Greg? Let's just call it Greg. You want to call it Greg? Yeah, you want to throw that in? <laughs> Can you test for Greg? You know, Greg right. is not really very. You're not really probably gonna ever see Greg in a mushroom without like a mass spec because, as yes. far as like baseline resolution goes, I mean, it's it's dephosphorylated aruginacin. Aruginacin is already like a minor product. Uh, um, I'd be surprised to see it there. Um, but I'm working on this method. So uh, once I when basically I still just need to tease out. Um, you see how there's peaks that are still slightly touching at the base. They're not fully separated sure. from each other. Yeah. So in order to accurately quantitate, um, ideally I'll get those um, a little bit moved away from each other. Um, now, how do you do that? Is that a different column? Is that a different, what do you do well, to see, do if that? If you go the different column route, then you got to spend more money. So ideally you okay. don't do that and you work with what you have because you're poor. And you right. Fund it by yourself you can, and there's a few things you can do with column heat, flow rate, and some other variables to try to get them so to parameters separate. you guys can play with to do that okay because my understanding then is the the location of the peak for the time identifies it whereas the 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 volume of that peak can give you an indication of the percentages that roughly how that works yeah retention like how, time allows you to identify and the peak area allows you to quantitate okay so when you guys are running these you're able to you're not really running for identification because you're assuming the sample will have these things in it and they they land on the 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 retention time where they're supposed to so you're mostly running for percentage of it in the the solution that you're running is that yeah, correct? it depends on the client's uh, ask. You know, I have some people mm -hmm. come in and say, I want to know what's in here. Test for everything that you can. And other okay. people are like, I want to know how much Slosin is there. You know, so it's just, it's basically just catering to the client's needs. Gotcha. So these, these uh, chromatographs are cleaned up then because theoretically there's other stuff in there. Is that right? Or um, well, this is where go the, back. Go ahead. If you go back to the Zapotec Orum slide, the, the spectra and the chromatography, uh, yep, yep. that's a crude extract of Slosby Zapotec Orum methanol okay. uh, with detection uh, set to 280 nanometers. And um, yeah, what, well, what helps is, so what's interesting is if you look on the graphs on the right, um, the tryptamine's maximum absorbance is over at 220. So if you set your detector to 220, you get really, really nice. More accurate, heat. yeah. But there's a lot of other junk in the mushrooms that it also absorbs at 220. So your chromatography sometimes looks a little cruddy. At least mine does. Okay. And so if you go to the second absorbance max, which is that second hump over there, um, mm -hmm. between like 260 and 280, um, you can get um, some, some nice looking chromatography without having to do any like uh, actual physical sample post-extraction purification. Gotcha. Uh, but it depends. Like I have, um, I've analyzed some gymnopolis, which are um, a, a psilocybin producing mushroom in a different genus. And mm -hmm. they have a molecule in them. I was just talking to my friend Ian about this. Uh, they have a molecule in them that um, uh, eludes at the same time as psilocybin. So um, so does it, it confi that particular strain compound or confounds that, that result? That particular uh, species, species of gymnopilus, yeah. uh, gymnopilus punctifolius, um, I was unable to get a definitive answer uh, whether or not it contains psilocybin via uh, HPLC UV biz. Um, but it's one on, I just actually collected a bunch of it. I'm really interested in finding out because it, um, no one really knows. And it has, um, it's, it's related to some active gymnopilus. So it would be really interesting. Okay. So now see if you get the same retention times in the hillock format versus the reverse phase. Yeah, like maybe I, I should send it over to you. Yeah, I'm yeah, dude, you guys can meet it. for lunch one day and share samples. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that, that okay, saves I got you from having to buy a column, and you can see if hillock separates them. There you go. Okay, I got you from having to buy a column, and you can see if hillock separates them. Nice. Interesting. 
Glow in the dark mushrooms, my favorite. That was very cool. Here, let me take that the scream off. There we go. Um, okay, I got a question. So I was going to ask this a little bit later, but let me ask it now because it, it came up in uh, the um, uh, viewer questions here. So you guys are traditionally, correct me if I'm wrong, using methanol for your as your solvent to pull all of these molecules out of the, the mushroom. Is that right? Now we're getting into the import stuff. Okay, yeah. This, because that, that makes me think any given solvent is going to pull a certain set of molecules out of the mushroom, right? So yeah, if I'm so using methanol, can I... In, I was going to say solvent yeah. properties will definitely influence the extraction. So yeah, do you guys want to talk a little bit about what you use, why you use it, and what... Um, I, I've, you know, ethanol versus methanol, obviously for me extracting at home, I'm going to use food grade ethanol, um, or Everclear. Um, I'm not going to be using stuff like diether or ether, um, stuff like that. Yes. Or diethyl ether. My bad. Sorry. You can tell I am not a chemist. <laughs> All good. I should have just said DCM and sounded <laughs> fancy. I use methanol methane. there's some um, there's some good published literature as far as it being the more universal solvent that's able to um, grab both the polar and nonpolar tryptamines out of the sample. Ethanol okay. is better probably for you at home to be making your own right. extracts because it's not as it's not toxic or I mean yeah. it's toxic but it's not as toxic. Um, right. But it does, you know, ethanol being different from methanol in that it has a, a longer carbon chain. It's more lipophilic. And so it has a harder time um, pulling psilocybin as easily. But um, and so for so for us and we want something simple and quick um, and we don't have to extract it multiple times because um, for simplicity efforts, um, methanol is the better solvent for analysis and some people also will spike their methanol um with a little bit of acid um and and some people say that uh some some chemists say that that helps stabilize and um, helps extract some of the phosphorylated uh, molecules better so uh, you guys are basically lemon teching your uh your samples you well can. it's a very small amount and it's yeah, not I'm teasing. water so. it's acetic acid usually it is. Okay. Um, so I actually uh, use the exact same information and I use the exact same method as Jordan. Um, <clears throat> well, not exactly, but same solvent. And uh, what I initially did was look into sonication because uh, I was trying to avoid a two day method where you have to soak your samples overnight to get the most optimal extraction, which is what a lot of people do. I thought, Hey, maybe I could bypass that by sonicating it, right. Using high frequency sound waves to burst open the fungal cells. Yeah. Well, it turns out that, uh, I actually just did this experiment recently. Um, when you soak overnight in methanol and you do an, you get 20% more out than if I do a immediate you know, uh, if I just put the methanol in my tube and sonicate it right away, I'm getting about a 20% higher recovery by soaking overnight. And um, I believe Jordan soaks his 24 hours as well, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I did try to acidify my methanol and do the experiment to see, I think I used like 10 millimolar acetic acid in mm -hmm. methanol, which is pretty low amount Barely, of acid. Barely, yeah. Um, but it should have been... Uh, should have, it didn't make any difference uh, at, on that particular experiment. I got the exact same results. Uh, however, I do want to try maybe a little bit more acidity and combine it with the overnight soak and then uh, try to, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can. And I know that Jordan is too. Uh, extracting the fruiting body is the most challenging aspect of uh, mushroom testing, in my opinion, because um Fungal cell walls are tough. Chitin is a very strong polymer. That, yeah, just uh, ask my GI tract that. I, yeah. it, it knows that very well. Exactly. So, and that's um, another thing I'm really interested in that we can talk about a little bit later is like this whole 
dosing thing. Like in my opinion, because I've got the opportunity to test a lot of gummies and actually test them myself. Um, mm-hmm. It is absolutely abundantly clear to me. And this is something I spoke about on the shape and fire podcast. When you remove the alkaloids from the fruiting body and you put it into a liquid or some aqueous product, like a gummy, you're getting all that in your bloodstream immediately. Oh, yeah. Whereas I believe with the mm-hmm. mushroom biomass, it's more like a time release. Uh, you know, oh, for sure. We're, we're, yeah. we're not able to break down all that biomass immediately. It's like Jordan said, the maceration with our teeth, the acidity in our gut, but we don't have enzymes that break down chitin. Like we, we just lack those. So mm-hmm. we rely solely on chewing and our acidity, which is why I believe I've read that orally ingested uh, psilocybin about 50% is absorbed. So, you know, Mm. this whole dosing thing, when people eat five grams of mushrooms, say it's a 1%, right? So then what you're getting uh, about 50 milligrams of alkaloids, um, really you're only going to absorb about 25% of those. So then you have people making these chocolates and gummies and stuff like that. And I'll tell you what, a milligram in a gummy is a lot different than a milligram in biomass. You can feel a milligram in a gummy pretty easily. Whereas if you eat a milligram in biomass, I've never felt that. So that's something that I find absolutely fascinating. You actually brought up in that podcast, you were talking about, um, let me see if I can remember this. The, The cannabis does better in chocolate products. Yeah. But not, not as well in gummies. Whereas the, because psilocybin is water soluble, it exactly. likes gummy products and it doesn't like fatty lipid type. Stuff. Exactly. And if, uh, okay. if, if anybody has any knowledge of the cannabis industry, you'll know that your edibles are very inconsistent, right? Especially if they are gummies or but like a brownie oh, yeah. or a cookie, something with butter or fat in it, it's way easier to make those consistent. Oh. And so the opposite is going to be true with psilocybin, uh, products when they people try to make uh, chocolates and things with fat in them. I've tested some chocolates that have a bunch of it in one end of the, of, and nothing in the other end. Whereas wow. the gummies I've tested tend to be pretty consistent because the alkaloids mix really evenly in the gummy. And then when they pour the mold, it should be relatively consistent. Interesting. That is very cool. Okay. So let's get back. Um, so I feel like I want to say a little bit more about some of these other alkaloids um, how about, uh, the beta carbolines? Am I saying that right? Carbolines, carbolines. Carbol- and, uh, Jordan was talking about the, the, just some of the other stuff that isn't, um, your standard five alkaloids you're testing for. Why might we want to start testing and tracking that? Um, I know the beta carboline stuff is all about, uh, the Paul Stamets, neurogenesis, you know, uh, neuroprotective, um, effect in the brain. Do you guys want to talk a little bit or do you have an opinion or interest in that? I have a slide that I sent you with the beta carboline structures. If you want to pull them up. Oh, is that the, in the bigger, I think it's in the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. Don't pull up that one slide that might get us flagged. Sure. I'm going to let Jordan take this one because I don't know much about beta carboline. I haven't had a lot of time to dig into that one. All right, let me find the beta carbolines are an interesting one. They uh, just got discovered in to be present in psilocybin fungi in 2019 out of uh, Dr. Dirk Hoffmeister's lab um, in Germany. Uh, Dr. Felix Bly, that was his project. Um, Is this the one? That's the one. Yep. And in that slide there, I actually gave a little credit to Felix. Um, The bottom right corner, they did a Maldi mass spec imaging of a culture. I believe it's Lassabi Cubensis. It might be Tampanensis. Um, Don't quote me. And basically the, the, the color intensity going from dark blue to bright red is the the concentration of beta carbolines in those specific areas of them. So that's actually like um, uh, mycelium growing on a Petri dish. <clears throat> and so they image oh. like the where the beta carbolines are being concentrated in the mycelium. Oh, no way. Do you know how they were detecting them? Uh, like how do they do the color pattern? Do you know? 
Uh, through through uh, in situ Maldi MS. Oh, okay. Um, so it's yeah. Um, I've seen one a, of those. A process I don't understand. Yes, but the colors are cool. I understand that. Basically, I'm pretty sure like um, a, a laser shoots it off of the matrix and it uh, gets vaporized off of each mm -hmm. little individual area, and they were able to they're able to like quantitate um, in individual gotcha. basically little pixels. Oh, so it has to read that whole region. It's reading that whole region. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Each little color pixel is a is a read. Oh, Got wow. it. Okay. Um, to my understanding, um, and so I know this slide's a little silly. I like it was at this. Um, it was at a Oakland Hyphy event in uh, Arcata, California, kind of around Halloween time last year. Um, but beta carbolines. So these are some of the some of the beta carbolines that were discovered in in magic mushrooms. So we have norharmane, harmane, harmal, harmine, perlolirine, and the cordycinin CMD. Uh, kind of ran through that, but they're all um, beta carbolines. And the interesting thing about the study, you know, they're, everyone's really excited about them but um, they're mostly concentrated in the mycelium. And from their initial reports, they're not in high enough concentrations to be um, clinically relevant. Significant, okay. Um, so you'd, so not in fruiting bodies and mycelium. So you'd have to produce massive amounts of mycelium and then go s through some extraction process with which big pharma is never going to do anyway. So. For cubensis and for uh, tamponensis, which are the two that were um, reported on. Um, e yes, basically you have to grow up some biomass and you need to extract it. And then right. you need to do a, a purification with uh, maybe some, maybe some deemsters in the chat, but uh, mm -hmm. an acid base extraction um, to, to concentrate them down. Okay. To get a good amount. However, so now, uh, can you possible. synthesize these though, right? I mean, if they are beneficial, these could be synthesized. Well, the homola alkaloids are in like uh, Syrian rue. So a lot of people will mix uh, oh. mix that with their mushrooms to get more bang for their buck. Because okay. the, 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 the um, beta carbolines are um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they basically inhibit the breakdown of monoamines, which uh, psilocybin, just like serotonin, is right. part of that class. So um, you drive further with the, with the same amount mm -hmm. of um, psilocybin. And so some people. It's like do, the same concept for ayahuasca, right? You need that inhibitor to get the DMT to work. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Uh, so here we go, your buddy Ian. Yeah. And so Ian. Um, Silo Huasca. Ian oh is a great silo chemist as well so yeah. you guys are honored to have him in the chat as well um, oh yeah he'll be he'll be helping out i'm sure and uh, i really appreciate him being here but yeah the 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 bligh group with dr hoffmeister i think they coined silo um, nice and so I've been, oh it's yeah i see it. it's in your slide okay i missed it and i've been um i might have spelled it wrong but i um i've been working a lot pretty closely with this species that was uh revered by um, some of the indigenous peoples in Southern Mexico, uh, Salaspi Zapotecorum. And, um, yeah, there I'm it is. Pull there. it up for you. There's a little certificate there. Um, and so if you actually bioassay this stuff, it's very intensely DMT like, like it's very strong visuals, not a ton of body load, um, lasts a, a pretty long time. And, um, yeah, it's just really good stuff. And I mean, aside from it having, uh, three percent by dry weight up to psilocybin or combined uh, tryptamines. I did a little quick TLC on it, and it did have um, some fluorescent spots just from a crude um, extract. So it's it's possible that um, that other psilocybin mushrooms, and I, I don't really want to, to say this definitively, but it it's not totally ruled out that other psilocybin mushrooms don't have pharmacologically relevant amounts of beta carbolines in them. Um, we just don't know yet. We just don't know yet. We just need more testing. And so, so now, so going back to the, your beta carboline slides here. Um, so would I need a, would, would you need a standard for each one of these? Yeah. Yeah, you would, you would. Um, but they're pretty cheap because they're not scheduled. Okay. So they're, they're relatively affordable. I think you could probably get all of them for the same price of a, 
a certified one or the other. material okay. of psilocybin and psilocin. So, uh, but the thing is, they're um, you know detecting them uh, analytically. I think as far as with HPLC and like quantitating via HPLC, it would be a more expensive test for people because there'd be more sample prep involved. Okay. Um, to my understanding, unless you got a fluorescence detector, which um, basically measures the fluorescence of molecules as they pass through the detector. So you can get a little bit lower detection limits um, with fluorescent molecules. Okay. But so on the machine, is that like a separate spot? You could, cause I, I see your guys' machines. They're like, stacked with modules yeah. right go so back yeah. to the so, flow chart uh-huh you would basically just like can you buy a plugin for that so you can do that each little piece is modular stack so you could put another mm -hmm. thing on the stack like another detector so you, you could, could have okay it. you could have the molecules exit the the uv vis detector and you could have them flow through the fluorescence detector oh, or okay. yeah you can actually set up multiple detectors you don't use them at the same time but there are valves with multiple exit ports so you could set it up to where you could utilize different detectors on the same machine you just use a different mm. flow path and you just you know designate that when you write your method i see mm -hmm. but um oh but for absence presence of beta carbolines um i think it's possible to test for people using uh using a simple method like tlc um so that's something i'm so you could at least start compiling some of that data too. Cause I, I'm just thinking like you guys are now in this unique position where you're doing something fairly novel. There's not a, a mountain of scientific data around this kind of testing. And so the data you're acquiring is important. Does it make you excited about what you're learning through all this process? Yeah, I think we're geeking. It's my absolutely, favorite man. mode, guys. I absolutely love this stuff, man. Like, I'll I'll have a bad day at my day job and go to my lab and just come home so happy. You know, it's I'm so like relieved and excited to be a part of this because I honestly feel like for the first time in my life, I'm well, it's not the first time. I actually enjoyed my work about 10 years ago. Um, for about 10 years, though, I've been very disenchanted with what I'm doing. And, uh, and now I just see the future look so bright. And I, you know, I, I, I know people that say, oh, my job isn't a job. I go and have fun and I get paid for it. And that's yeah, kind of like, people, I'm, I'm almost there. On. I'm almost there. So if I could, if, if this lab works out, I think that that's kind of the state I'll be in because I want to give a shout out to all the customers I've had so far and the people that I've met in this industry. Everybody has been amazing. The, the, the kindness and the openness and the willingness to help in this community is incredible. And there's a couple few people uh, that I just really owe a lot to and I uh, really appreciate them. Cool, man. Um, so I agree. So I don't have a strong background in the cannabis industry, but I talk to a lot of people in this community and a lot of people who come from cannabis say, boy, when I got into this community, I couldn't believe how nice everybody was. Now I've met some not nice people, so it's not like they're, you know, right. it, it's still people, but people do seem to have a very benevolent uh, tendency. Uh, it, well, if you, it, cool. If the psychedelics have had their way with you, then, you know, it tends to make people nicer. I, I, I think that's true. Okay. So real quick, uh, or not quick, uh, I had a couple people ask questions about, so what should we be asking or paying attention to trying to find out whether I'm talking to a shady guy or maybe not even shady, maybe just somebody that thinks they're doing a good job with their HPLC machine, but maybe isn't. So like, how do you establish baseline resolution? What protocols are you using? Um, you know, uh, are there such a thing as like bad places to get your standards from? What are the kind of questions people can ask a testing um, facility to start getting a read on whether they're a reputable place to be testing at or not. Mm. Like, what do you guys, I think maybe the better question is what do you guys do to ensure that your, your data is valuable? Is, is For accurate? me, that's regular QC testing, you know, using fresh standards always and uh, 
making <clears throat> checking column recoveries, making sure your column's not old and binding up things and not recovering them. So um, also, I think one of the most important things is, especially in a nascent industry, is customer service and replying to your customers and explaining to them what you're doing. And because like people transparency, dropping, being transparent. transparency, tr yeah. people are dropping good money on this. And the last thing I want to do is have someone question whether or not I'm doing a good job. And I think that starts with customer service and, and being open. Like there's only two pieces of information that I'm keeping private to protect my method, but I will basically reveal almost exactly how I'm doing all of this to anybody who asks. And, um, the most important thing is the quality of the standards and using fresh standards, in my opinion. Cool, man. What about you, Jordan? Does is that kind of echo your thoughts? I would say whatever you do, do not use Trip Labs. They're like the worst fucking place. Con <laughs> artist, piece of work. Uh, you're fine. <laughs> he doesn't even know what a standard is. Um, as far as like sussing out a sketchy lab. It's hard. I don't know. Is there sketchy labs? Like, who are you thinking of? I'm not thinking of anybody. I just, I, 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 I have heard stories from cannabis of, you know, doctoring samples and uh, having political affiliations and having, you know, stuff fudged. And so proficiency uh, testing had to come about and yeah, COAs and shit like that. Like, I mean, I think it's naive to assume that everyone's going to be doing a wonderful, amazing job. Right. Like I think it's, the, yeah, there's um, the big thing in cannabis is potency inflation. And it put a lot of like yeah. uh, legitimate cannabis labs out. Right. Because someone would go test their material and be right. like, Oh, yeah. I wanted to test higher. So then they go, test this other lab that you know some behind the scenes handshake happens and um yeah. you know i've had some conversations with smart people about the ways uh labs go about doing potency inflation um i hope people don't like aren't trying to do that in mushrooms i kind of is that would it be harder to do like would you feel like you would you would be able to identify an adulterated sample or I think it's harder to, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Identifying an adulterated sample would be tricky unless you knew the adulterant and you knew some impurity mm -hmm. in it that you could test for, at least with okay. diode array detection. That would be something that's more up for like mass spec, um, okay. to my understanding. Um, you know, with, with psilocybin mushrooms, though, you can spike the substrate with, uh, with tryptophan or tryptamine yeah. and actually observe increased uh, conversion of psilocybin. So... Mm -hmm. um, there probably will be that of, of people spiking their substrates. Um, well, so, them. and not even just that, but I, I, in some of the HPLC testing I've seen from both of you guys, it's slightly suggestive that what you put in your substrate can potentially have an effect on potency, maybe not in a, a radical way, but to some degree. So going forward, if you're trying to have some sort of standard understanding of potency, um, as this marketplace gets bigger, and uh, especially if we were in a situation where it's federally, uh, you know, at least medically uh, legalized or decriminalized in much of the country, the industry would get huge. CO, you'd start using the COAs. You would you would want a way to standardize the potency testing. So then, wouldn't you also have to standardize how you're growing the mushrooms if we're still growing them? If they're not just being made by E. coli and some yeah, I have lab an analogy somewhere. for that. Like in terms of spiking the substrate with a precursor molecule, I don't think of that as adulterate as an adulterant. It's more like crop steering, like you know, in sure, in, yeah in uh you're providing the right kind of food to make the molecules you want that organism to make mm -hmm. and so i don't have any issue with that in terms of people Fair. trying to increase the potency of their fruiting bodies by providing the mycelium with substrate to produce you know precursor molecules to produce the alkaloids um and another thing i wanted to say is at least right now in the mushroom world i find it really difficult to come up with a financial motivation 
to for a lab to do that like i don't think any labs mm-hmm. that exist that i think i only know of like four or five labs in the whole country as as well so yeah i'm talking to a any, significant portion of them right now yes yeah I, I don't see a motivation for someone to um inflate people's numbers right because it's not like you're competing out there to sell your product with some regulated market once the regulation begins especially if there's like a medical sort of step like there was in cannabis i'm sure people will come up with some way to manipulate things you know if it's just straight up paying a lab to give higher numbers so they can get more money for their fruiting body or whatnot you know it's you know but for me my main argument for that is as a scientist, the only thing I have is my integrity. The only thing I have is my sure. word promising you that I'm going to do the best that I can to give you the best, most accurate results. Right. And if I fail at that, my business is done. And yeah. so yeah. that's kind of where I put my I put my eggs in that basket, just relying on my training, do the best science I can, and be honest with people, right? Like, for example, I just told yeah. you guys that um, – I got a 20% increase by doing an overnight soak in methanol. So I'm going to be going back to all the customers that I tested fruiting body and offering them a free test or two. You know, it's, it's just, that's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? I'm not going to say that actually is what, that was one of my questions, which was, so if you guys ever significantly improve your process for testing, how do you ethically handle that? Like if you go, Oh wow. You know, I think it just figured out a way and I feel the accuracy of, of my testing has gone up by say 20%. Yeah. It's, it's, it's on the right. burden is on the scientists to be honest with people. You know what I mean? Like, and as a nascent industry that is unregulated, there are no right. standard protocols. I mean, look, Jordan and I use two totally different protocols, but I bet we'd get pretty similar answers if we were, uh, you know, ever put to the test. I, I would, I would hope, <laughs> but uh, you know, you just, have to hope that people understand where the stage is and that if something like that does happen, you do the right thing and help your clients out. Like, so, you know, it's, I, I'm going to be drafting an email to send to every single person that's tested fruiting body and be like, would you like me to do a test for you? Like either the same fruiting body, if you have it or another one, if you're curious, it just, I don't know what else to do. I'm not going to sit back here and hide. I'm not going to keep it secret and just tell people, Oh, um, like what if somebody does have a consistent crop and then they start bringing in something and I give them higher numbers, I, you're just digging yourself a hole, right? Like, so once things are regulated right. and there, there's accreditation involved and there's a regulating body, then we're going to have PT testing. I mean, I would love for all of us labs to, to, to have some third party grind up a big bag of sample and send it to everybody and see what right. we get. You know, I would love to, to start working on lab to lab um, uh, uh, consistency, you know, because that's what you're supposed to do. Well, you guys are in the right state for that. I mean, if, right. if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen there first, for sure. Indeed, Maybe Michigan, I, we'll see. Indeed, we're not going to be able to do cross state out of state comparisons yet, you yeah. know, and, then, and we don't need to, because just like the cannabis industry, it's going to develop state by state. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't even see Jordan as a competitor really. I mean, there's going to, there's so few labs and there's going to be so many people that right. want this done. Like there's going to be other labs popping up too. So, you know, it's a, it's a capitalist society, you know, <laughs> let the strong survive as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys will you guys will both hire your uh, competing sign twirlers on the side side of the road, and who you know who who can do the most acrobatic maneuvers with their signs to. Yeah. No. And another thing that I'm recognizing here too is nobody's doing the exact same thing, right? I'm doing psilocybin testing, and I'm also doing the functionals and all that. Jordan's doing uh, uh, alkaloid testing, and he's looking at the carbolines and some of these other species that he's right. really interested in, right? It's like. I don't see a lot of competition here. I see a lot of collaboration and a lot of potential for helping each other out. So that's where I would like to see this go. I don't, I have no interest in like getting into beefs with labs or trying to like say one lab's better than the other because it's everybody's so new. We might all be screwing up. God damn it. I was just 
putting together my first episode of Lab Wars. <laughs> God dang it. Now I can't even now I can't even do that. God yeah. dang it. I don't know. I mean, this guy's got jujitsu on me. I wouldn't need that. <laughs> <laughs> I wrestled my whole life and I've done and I do jujitsu. So I it can definitely and he take has care of myself. Enlightened uh, anger issues. Watch out, Jordan. <laughs> you're you're done for. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. The the most thing I'd want to do is like train jujitsu with someone, teach people jujitsu. Yeah. That's a, that's actually what I would love to do as well. Like a, when I retire, I want to open up a school and, and teach kids oh, self defense. Yeah. No, but jujitsu on shrooms. That could be fun. That would be fun. There's actually a, a like a, a, a promotion called High Rollers where they get all baked and then and then uh, you know smoke cannabis yeah. and then do jujitsu. Yeah, it's actually the cannabis is really pretty heavily used by jujitsu people. A lot of pain, a lot of body aches. Yeah, man. When you when you mentioned uh, the the veteran population, I can say I, so. I've been in this this community for just shy of a year, and got interested. Went down the rabbit hole uh, because I'm ADHD, pretty hardcore. Uh, I could not stay on Adderall. I didn't like any of the other stuff I tried, and so I just thought, okay, cool. I'm, I was adult diagnosed, so I was like, cool. I'm just gonna go back to not taking anything and just trying to muscle through it and read an article one day that said, uh, you know, some people were microdosing and it was helping them. And here I am. So I, I I'm pretty excited about uh, just being involved in this community at this stage and, and seeing where it's going to go, whether it's lab wars, whether it's jujitsu mushroom microdosing sessions, hopefully it's at least just some, some therapeutic, that this doesn't just turn into a pill in a bottle, yeah, um, yeah. you know, down the road. I, I, I think there's enough to, because pharmacologically, Big Pharma does not have uh, anything like these drugs. No. I mean, maybe ketamine counts, but, you know, generally speaking, it's psychedelics are just absolutely not used in, in a clinical setting with, you know, the occasional K-hole uh, uh travel from a, a, a bad uh, anesthesia. But but overall, this is a really novel set of uh, drugs and, and it does a very unique thing. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited about going along in the journey and seeing what we do. I'm, I'm hoping it'll be at least just a touch different than, than how cannabis uh, has been shaping up. Uh, I yeah, think it'll be learned from that industry. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um, okay. So I got real quick that you mentioned about the drugs that we have on hand and from biopharma, I mean, from pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. I heard the most remarkable statistic at the Portland Psychedelic Society meeting a couple months ago. There was a gentleman presenting efficacy data for, you know, the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. Mm -hmm. Basically, they work about the same as a placebo. And when you look at the data coming in for psilocybin therapy, it's working about 75% of the time, mm -hmm. which is way higher than placebo. So yeah. we know they work and uh, we just got to be a part of this whole community and this uh, of getting them into the hands of people who need them with the assistance of the appropriate therapist that can steer yeah. them in the right direction and overcome a lot of these problems that they're having. Exactly. Um, yeah. So the, the ADHD thing I, I see as a, a trend in this community, as well as uh, a lot of PTSD, which as everybody knows is uh, one of the fringe benefits of being a, a veteran of uh, military service. And uh, it seems to, I, I cannot tell you how many, I mean, I may be close to a hundred stories of how if it wasn't for uh psychedelics typically mushrooms um people like man nothing nothing was doing it this this is uh, pretty much a miraculous drug so it's, it's pretty awesome okay i got some questions some viewer questions for you guys yeah i um, think bill is pretty uh eager to have this question answered i've seen it pop up. oh go for it go for it phil asked the question <clears throat> Can we also speak on the difference between mushroom silo concentrations between fruit in the same tub? 
if I test one mushroom in a tub, how value is that to represent the whole tub? Um, this is a great question. It is. I'm so, glad someone answered it because we need to talk about that. Yeah, so I think Go it's important it. to get into this. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not very, representative at all. It's very <laughs> dependent. I will say that. Um, and not only do you have the issue of one mushroom in a tub, um, you can have variability in content within the one mushroom. Absolutely. Uh, right. so I like have I've a very tests, specific example of that. Go ahead. I've done tests where I've um, tested something from uh, Yoshi Amano, a cultivator you guys might be familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and he sent me um, an Enigma type mutation uh, that he isolated from Huautla, the Huautla yep. strain uh, called, I think he named it Maria Sabina Huautla flowers. Yep. Um, and I tested some from a white portion and some from um, a blue portion. And the, the white portion came out to just clocked in just over 2% combined psilocybin, psilocin, biocystin. And I think that's this report is for that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, really... if you can zoom in, there's um, a blue. I can't. Yeah, there's a really, you can kind of see it from here though. There's just a really dark blue piece. And I mm -hmm. tested that, and that piece came in closer to 1%. Um, hmm. And so um, there's high variability. And uh, if you really, and it just really depends what your end product is and how that's getting to people. You know, it's really difficult for a lab to put a finite number on a single mushroom and have that be applicable to a batch of, batch, of yeah. 12 tubs. Right. Um, but there's things the cultivator can do. I think a lot of the variability comes in with, you know, starting off like ideally you have a clone, right? And you're running a, a single genetic. Um, right. And then ideally your harvest timing, uh, how you harvest and how you dry is all very dialed in. Um, and, yep. and, you know, as, as, as same as possible because uh, I've also done it where I've had albino penis envy. I've had one that's harvested when it's still white with a little bit of blushing blue on the cap. And I've had um, another one where it was the whole thing was like a blueberry and I dried them out and I tested them. There's pretty strong, significant difference in potency um, like 0.6 or 0.8% off the top of my head. Um, and so, you know, it's going to give people two completely different experiences when they, right. when they go for those. And so for people that are producing things that are made from powdered, mushrooms or powdered fungus like uh gummies chocolates uh if they're working with homogenized material um it's pretty good but as far as um you know how representative one mushroom is in a whole tub it really depends are you running multi-spore are you running a single clone are you harvesting right. all your things is there a certain benchmark harvest is there an exact way you dry um how do you is the tub up against a wall that's cold versus the ambient temperature in the room? One getting more lighting than the yeah. other. You know, there's right. there's there's tons of variables, and then it's hard because yeah. even if you send a lab a homogenate, which is basically the whole tub ground up, and I mm -hmm. spit out a number for you for that homogenate, that might not be representative if you're giving people individual mushrooms, right? You know, right. there's still that variability, and yep. so um, it's a it's a complicated answer. Um, but certainly a, a few tests of a few mushrooms in a tub can start to build a, a larger picture. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's exactly what I wanted to mention. Yep. And, and then, so then you could also, so say I'm, I'm isolating, a, I'm working ODPE. I, I, I got a, a really nice fruit. I'm, it's definitely worked off a of clone culture. I start sending it to Jordan. I send him a homogenized sample fr from one tub. He runs it two months later. I've, you know, maybe a, a few uh, generations down, down the road. I keep cycling through, trying to improve, improve stability. I keep sending a sample every, you know, say uh, every generation or every few generations in an attempt to see if I'm getting any consistency even going back to spore, right? That would be a way I could be testing for so consistency within a certain uh, isolation I'm working on. Yeah, the more data you can accumulate over time, the better you're going to be able to understand it. And I just right. wanted to e echo something Jordan said, uh, because I've seen the exact same thing. I had a customer send me 
uh, it was a single mushroom. The veil was closed. It hadn't opened yet. He cut the tip of the mushroom off. He kept the, the, the junction between the stalk and the, and the cap where it was closed. Oh, I, and, then I I, remember and, this. and then the bottom stem. And I got three drastically different concentrations from the three different parts of the mushroom with the, the veil cap region testing at almost 2% and both of the other ones less than 1%. So it was a right. humongous difference. And then I had another customer take a pound of mushrooms, grind them all up, vacuum, like take samples from three different spots Mm -hmm. and then vacuum seal it, wait a month. And he did that for three different months because he was actually more interested in the storage. And so if I remember right. correctly, he dehydrated them by uh, drying at an elevated temperature. It wasn't super hot, but it was like dry heat. I don't think it was like a dehydrator or freeze dryer or anything like that. It was just standard drying. Mm -hmm. And we consistently got 0.6% for the whole time. The, the, the change over a four month period was only 2%. And so vacuum sealed, stored, right. stored at 60 degrees in the dark. Um, but uh, so that kind of is related to what we were talking about, the different mushrooms. But I've also, uh, I've been trying, I realize this is expensive, but I've been trying to get people into batch testing, especially people right. that are making gummies or chocolates. It's like they test one gummy and they're saying that's the concentration of all the gummies. For right. the gummies, you might be able to get away with that because of the stuff we talked about earlier and the, the solubility. Um, however, I'm trying to get people to test multiple mushrooms from the same uh, flush or, uh, um, but a lot of people, you know, they're limited by the amount of money they have, but then you just have to be sure. saying, you know, that I can only give you the concentration for this mushroom. Like if you test, you know, five in the batch, you might be able to get an average and then say, oh, this batch is the average of those. I mean, there's lots of approaches we can take to try to standardize this, but we just have to get a, you know, everybody on board. Well, what about, so say I have a tub and I pull one fruit and then I dry, I dry everything, but I pull one fruit, I keep it whole. And then I homogenize just that, a sample of that fruit. And then I collectively grind up and homogenize the whole rest of the tub. I could then have a mean uh, potency for the homogenate from the tub versus that individual fruit. And if I kept doing that in, in a series of batch tests, I might come to yeah. a slightly better yeah. understanding of, because what in my head, my goal would be if I was trying to make a product that was consistent, I'm just. I'm constantly trying to figure out how can I make a variety or isolate uh, genetics within the variety so that the potency yeah. range gets tighter. What you're basically talking about is uh, what we refer to as data trending. And we do this in my day job all the time when we repeat batches of the same process and we get all these analytics at the end. And then every time we do that, we put this into a presentation where we look at the data trending and that way you can see mm -hmm. things that go out of range, you know, pretty easily. And so, right. and as over time, it should tighten as well. But, you know, there are so many variables when it comes to cultivation of organisms that um, it's going to take a pretty huge effort and a large yeah. number of people to, to really work this stuff out. It's just going to take time. Uh, okay. I got another question for you guys. A lot of people love the silo Q test. Super popular. Even before they submit to the cup, they love to do a silo Q and I've heard many, many people say, yep, spot on with, with uh, you know, right there with the cup results. And then I have other people say all over the place. I already know that there's probably some user uh, sampling error going on there. But do you guys want to talk a little bit about your opinion of that test? If you have any experience with it, how accurate it is or isn't, um, how it might be valuable, how, how you might be able to use it in conjunction with the HPLC testing. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, the silo Q tests are great. They're um, developed by some really smart guys over in Germany. And um, I think the main thing is using them within what they're, how they're supposed to be used. Um, I know previously I had, I had mentioned to some people that they could possibly cut down their sample size in half. Basically what happens is that the cutoff for those things is 2%. Sometimes when people right. test really strong mushrooms on them, it just gets so dark that they can no, no longer read. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, some people are trying to, to cut the initial sample in half or, or dilute the sample before 
reacting it with the reagent. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, any of that stuff is really how the creators intended for the things to be used. Um, so I think so long as they're used as intended, um, they're great tools, affordable tools. Um, and yeah, they're, they're great for what they are. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have, you know, if you're a breeder that has something that does come over, I think their range is maxed out at 2.4% or something like that. So if you have something that comes over that on the test, um, you know, that's when it's important to maybe, um, if you're have the funds and you're interested to come into a lab and have it tested on them right. on HPLC. Uh, yeah, I don't have any personal experience with the silo Q test. I have had a couple customers refer to them and uh, they seem to, all, all the, all the words I've gotten from them are positive. I haven't had anybody nice. really say, Oh, that was so way off, but it's only been a few people. I, it hasn't been a large sample size. Uh, so I don't have anything positive or negative to say. It sounds like Jordan has a, a, a lot better knowledge of them and, uh, you know, it seems like they're very, uh, very useful. And <clears throat> he said something really important that is across the board with things it's like you have to use these things for for what they're intended for. And, uh, you know, you just got to be careful. You got to be careful with your weighing, follow the instructions really carefully and just do the best you can to, to, to execute the SOP that they provide. And I'm sure you'll get pretty accurate results because I haven't uh, uh, everybody said positive things about them to me. Nice. Um, so I got a question for you. Um, this is my personal. I'm very interested in crowdsourcing funds to do sort of benevolent testing. Everybody wants to know how potent is the strain of mushroom that I grow or, you know, uh, the strain I'm working on that I'm going to use in a gummy product or something like that. I'm very interested in all the, the what can we learn about these mushrooms through the use of these tests. So uh, my first question to you guys is what experiments, if you had unlimited money, if you were just like a, you know, a retired Jeff Bezos and this is what you did for fun, what things would, what sort of experiments would you be setting up right now and, and working on? Like, what do you want to learn through the use of specifically this, this kind of testing? Uh, yeah, I think what I would focus on initially is, you know, extraction. I, I, I just think that's the most challenging part of testing. Um, there's just not a lot of really good information out there about, you know, okay, I know exactly what I would do. <laughs> All right. So I would get a bunch of chitinase enzyme, and then I would use an enzyme to digest all of the chitin away and mm -hmm. I think that would probably be the best way to get the most accurate, you know, alkaloid content. But, you know, that's not something you could put into a high throughput process. Uh, but it could give us an idea of how much we're leaving behind on average. Interesting. So I actually tried to buy some. I tried to buy some of that, the chitinase enzyme. You can buy a nice little bottle for 100 bucks, but I figured what. I don't even know what the hell I would do with it other than yeah, fart to digest and mushrooms it. and test alkaloids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of making something similar from um, uh, liquid culturing some trichoderma and then just do oh, yeah. the extract of that. Yep. Um, and using that to isolate like fungal protoplasts. Um, but it's just, you know, it's one of those back burner projects. There's like 500 million things you could do. Yeah. I think so, I'd also uh, look into trying to put a. Uh, Chocolates are also pretty challenging, right? Because of the whole fat part. But uh, uh, I am pretty confident in the method. Like I definitely feel like it, it's, uh, I, I use some tricks in the cannabis industry with like de, uh, defatting it by putting it in the freezer and stuff like that and phase separating the lipids out so that I can get to the, to the soluble part and stuff like that. And I do all the chocolate stuff is based on mass, not volume. So it's a lot more accurate and you don't have to, you know, measure solutions to get concentrations. You can just weigh it and use the mass. So that's another thing I would probably do. Nice. I would hire, if I had unlimited money, I'd also hire a technician for sample prep. Yeah, a good one, <laughs> an anal retentive one. Yes. Yes. 
Um, okay, so I just saw, I'm trying to go back here and follow this. I think uh, a couple guys here were asking some questions. Um, all right, they're talking about, I think they're talking about some of the other tryptamines here. I'm just trying to catch up. Okay, never mind. They might be talking some serious shop here. I don't know if we need to necessarily go into that. I think they're um, about doing some crazy things. Yeah. Um, so uh, a, a real basic question. This goes along with um, batch testing. Um, so I got a lot of, lot of friends that really want to figure shit out, and they run tests, and some of them hire you guys to do HPLC testing. And some don't, some just do, you know, some good old fashioned side by side, trying to, trying to control as many variables as they can. Um, and so a lot of times somebody will run one side by side test, get a result, and then use that as, uh, you know, a significant bit of information. So my question is, how many tests, how much data do we need? So say I, in, in my discord, say we decide we want to run some experiment and uh, we're looking for uh, to test a certain hypothesis, how much, like how big of a sample size should I have before I can even begin to say maybe there's something here? That basically comes down to like the rules of statistics. It's like how much mm -hmm. confidence do you want in your yeah. results? So, you know, you do the you know, P equals whatever, and then you have to mm -hmm. accommodate uh, do as many experiments necessary to get the data to accommodate that level of scrutiny. Okay. So I'm not a so, statistic, st statistics expert. So I, but like it is, so I, I think numbers. I'm looking for, um, just a magic rudimentary number. A am I trying? So say I'm so, okay, I'll give you an example. I'm going to grow, uh, mushrooms on just cocoa core versus manure. So, you know, amended with manure and a bunch of other stuff, whatever. So I'm, I'm trying to do the CV that everybody grows on versus uh, amended substrate. And I'm going to run uh, one variety and I get, I get a result from that. You know, the CV has a certain potency with this, uh, this clone culture that, that I'm using uh, for the test. And it's a little bit more potent with the manure. And then I do another one with the, the, the same culture. And I just keep running that. By the time I run three tests, do I have something maybe, uh, and especially if those numbers start uh, correlating with each subsequent test, is it five? Is it eight? Is it 15? Like before I'm coming up with some results that are significant, is there sort of a ballpark? Um, no. You'd need to uh, know off the top of your head uh, statistical significance. Yeah. And um, it's a little outside the field of my expertise. Maybe someone in the chat is like really smart about that stuff, though. And, uh, yeah, basically, it, it, like we both mentioned, the statistics have rules. Like in order to get to a certain significance level, you have to have a certain amount of replicates, right? Sure. Typically, in the things that I do, um, when you're talking about the same sample, you would mm -hmm. test it three times, right? To get mm -hmm. uh, uh, error bars that are, uh, you need at least three to do the most minimum amount of statistics. Okay. Now, but that's within one sample. And then you have between right. sample sampling and, and testing and stuff like that. So um, it really comes down to the design of your experiment and the question you're trying to answer. So it all kind of, backs off from that. So for example, say I want to test the variability in potency in my batch. So you're going to say, I don't mm -hmm. know, I'll take, pick 10 different samples, uh, 10 individual mushrooms from a single tub and test those. And then that would be enough to do a little bit of statistics on exactly what significance level I'm not sure, but you do have to start getting into that sort of number, you know, double digit numbers right. to, to get really good results. And then say you get a mean, you get a spread of the data, and then you just let the, the statistics tell you the answer. So, right. 
as little uh, as, three, well, as many as a hundred. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I have a few people chime in here first. Uh, Mike Denver chimed in, um, saying and a 30 is what my stats professor requires for a minimum sample size. Um, and then nice. Ian chimed in uh, minimum 100, and then he went on to say most statisticians agree that the minimum, uh, any meaningful result is 100. Now, I know working in healthcare, when I'm reading uh, cohort studies, I mean, I want them in the maybe an absolute minimum of 20 to 40. Um, maybe that would be enough to spur on more research in that area. Um but definitely hundreds, if not thousands, before I'm yeah. going. Well, there well, you go. Unfortunately, the, the main driver that usually decides the number is how much money you have. So yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a handcuff, typically. The What you guys are supposed to say is we have 100 test packages available for only $15,000. <laughs> Bring it that's on. The, yes, that's <laughs> the answer. You sign up on the free hot dog. What's that? So you sign up online, you get a free hot dog. Was your there you go. A, a free spore print with every purchase. It's a Costco one too. They're a hell of fire. Oh, they're, they're huge. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, we sort of, uh, well, no, I want to ask this question next. Um, most shocking results. Is there any result that just you didn't expect it? It surprised you? It could be a specific strain or species that was radically more potent or had stuff in it you didn't expect. It could be something that was harder to test for than you thought. It could be uh, commonalities you're starting to notice like, oh, I, you know, for example, oh, I thought maybe this uh, solvent would be better than methanol, but nope, it turned out that do you know what I'm saying? Like it can just be anything that has surprised you. I don't know if this is the most surprising, but you just said something that made me think of it. Um, when I was re trying to tooling my extraction, I looked at a aqueous uh, 3.5 pH extraction with a buffer, basically ammonium formate at pH 3.5. And uh, it was a mess. Like there's so many breakdown products and there was so much garbage in there. I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. So I was like, not trying that again. Yeah. And then, so, you know, the different, I would say the ability of different solvents to pull out wildly different uh, profiles from the same material. Cause I've uh, done some consulting mm. with a, a person that's done numerous extracts with uh, different methods, different uh, solvents, different uh, combinations of solvents. And we saw some, some crazy stuff. It was really interesting. Wow. Um, crazy, un unexpected, surprising, weird. It's all crazy, yeah. dude. I mean, where do you want to start? Uh, pull up some of those COAs. Let's see. Uh, well, we did the zaps. What else do I? Oh, you know, it's crazy, right? Like over two percent. I know the in the hyphy cup there was that TW two that tested at. 3.82 percent which is mind-boggling i don't know how they did that but um yeah i would I mean, love to have a sample like that sent to a bunch of labs and see what we all got yeah yeah totally so have you guys ever um okay i don't I, i'm assuming i'm not the only one particularly with an albino strain that the blues rapidly have you ever noticed that some of the fruit, the entire cross section where, where you cut it is entirely blue. And then on the, the next fruit right next to it, there might only be a tiny little vein of bluing in that cross section running up maybe just one side of it. And then you just keep, as you're harvesting these, you just start noticing that bluing is not consistent. It, it doesn't look the same and ever. It's not like if you, I just harvested a bunch of gnats and they all look the same. You cut them, they blew instantly. Um, very consistent, but some of this more uh, lab worked strains seem to have a lot of variability. And I'm assuming that means that where I see more blue is probably ha at least had more psilocybin in it. Um, well, it's not always a direct measure of psilocybin. It's a combination sure. of factors and, um, 
you know, because the blue color is the oligomerization of, of psilocin. So you have a mm -hmm. few, you have the molecules there, and then you also have the enzymes there. And you have multiple different enzymes there that are responsible for getting to that bluing point. So, oh, so um, it could actually just be a lack of the enzymes. It might could be not a lack even. Of the enzymes. Right. Typically, the, um, typically, the higher psilocybin strains bruise really intensely blue. So it is a, a pretty good visual indicator. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anyone that's like intentionally selecting for higher or lower levels of these enzymes. Um, you know, it'd be uh -huh. cool to get to work to a strain that, you know, didn't blue at all, but it was over yeah. two percent. It would be highly commercially valuable because then yep. during harvest you wouldn't be destroying actives. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah. or even or even isolating for where it's located within the the fruit. Is it in the internal part of the stipe versus the external? That then it would potentially provide some sort of. And a lot of the stuff that people that are working right now, they're working these crosses. They might be like highly heterozygous, you know, or they have like expression right. of different traits. Um, That's true. It's, um, you know, the question I think is still up in the air. I don't really have any rigorous data where I'd be confident giving you or the viewers an answer to that question. Yeah, well, anyway, 3% on the zaps was enough to get me to want to that's get some a range of the spores. Too, right? that's, I mean, I, I, I flex that one, but that's the strongest that they've tested at. Mm -hmm. and that's also since I've started doing moisture correction. I find that mushrooms are sponges. And yeah. so, um, yeah. you know, it doesn't inhibit the test to have water in the extraction. And in fact, psilocybin is a little bit more soluble when there is water in there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like... As long as there's not a high enough concentration of water to where the enzymes can be active, you're still not going to generate any artifacts of analysis. But um, yeah, the, the desiccation factor can make a, a, a significant difference, um, especially if you have well, samples in like Ziploc baggies and stuff. Yeah. So they're not if you get mine, they're going to be bone dry. You're not even going to pull a quarter yeah, of a percent out of those suckers. That's interesting. Yeah. I, most of the samples I get are... 99% dry. Yeah. Most of the time when I do my dehydration test, it's less than 1%, <clears throat> which is cool. Yeah. But then also it's almost like I don't have to do the hydration, but I do <laughs> mm -hmm. the dehydration. But yeah, definitely. If you have like a, a sample that was, you know, dried to a crisp by a, by a customer and they ship it and it's not sealed well, it can gain moisture during the travel. Or when I take it out, mm -hmm and bring, just open it in the room, especially when it becomes winter here in Oregon, <clears throat> the humidity is through the roof. And I don't yeah. know if you guys have ever tried drying buds in when it's not, when it's super humid out, it takes forever and stuff forever. just absorbs the water from the air. So <clears throat> the moisture correction is important. Um, I got a question for you. Uh, no, 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 no. Wants to know. And I think George, you 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 talked about this uh, in the the Shaping Fire podcast a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you standardize that level of moisture if it's not zero? Uh, whoops. Yeah. So what you do is uh, <clears throat> when you get your data. Excuse me for one second here. <clears throat> when you get your data off of the machine, I'll make this very round numbers just to make it easy. Uh, say you have a one percent sample. Okay. And uh, you go and you take the, a, a separate piece of biomass and you dehydrate it and say you lose, uh, you, uh, it had 10% uh, moisture in it, right? So 10% mm -hmm. moisture is basically, it becomes a conversion factor. So now you're going to basically multiply that by 10%. So now it's going to be 1.1%. And Sure. after the dry weight correction. So, you know, for example, and so you take a portion of the sample for that. Yes. It's a separate okay. sample. Cause I heat mine in a dehydrator to get the rest of the, the moisture out. And you don't want to test a sample that you're putting heat or light or anything. You know, right. I protect everybody's samples. I keep them in the dark as close to 60 degrees as I can until I pull them out and test them. Or if they're extracts or gummies, they go in the fridge in the dark and then, you know, I, I do the extractions and the sample prep immediately. I don't let things sit out. And then, so I, I request two grams of 
biomass of fruiting body when I have to do that. And my actual extraction is 300 to 400 milligrams. So that leaves me about a gram and a half for a sample re-extraction if, if there's a problem or the, the customer needs it repeated. Mm -hmm. And then I leave another gram to do the dehydration test. And then I correct the sample based on the dehydration. All right. Uh, no, no, no is, is hitting us with some good questions. I think this is not directly HPLC, but this is something you guys probably are starting to see data on. So um, a lot of people love to argue about what's too hot, what's not hot enough, um, speed versus temp. Uh, what are you guys thinking? Go ahead, Jordan. Um. I personally uh, just stick to uh, procedures that have been published in the literature. So um, I stick to like 39 Celsius for drying, which is like around, I don't know. I said it's a 39. Was it 105 or 120 Fahrenheit? Uh, I think it's about, about, it's about 100. Yeah. 40 so, C is like 100. F. So, yeah. so maybe I think my dehydrator, I think I said it to 105 in it. Okay. Um, you know, usually the actual, what the actual temperature is, is less than what it's set to. So, um, but I don't, you know, as far as psilocybin goes, um, I haven't seen any data that suggests it really degrades at the highest setting of the dehydrator, 160. Um, I don't have any rigorous data to prove that, but it seems fairly stable. Um, more of the miners might be troublesome with the higher temperatures. You might cook them okay. off with the phosphorylated ones, you know, nor psilocin, psilocin. Um, but I don't have enough data to answer that question yet. Yeah. I've read in the literature that something that claimed like 60 C and there wasn't a lot of degradation and I don't remember how long they did it for, but they're fairly thermally stable. You know, if you're not heating it up to an insane temperature, you're probably going to be okay. I would imagine that light and oxygen are bigger issues. But I'm not a grower. I've never grown mushrooms. I, I'm definitely not the person to ask here. But I do understand the mechanisms of oxidation quite well mm -hmm. and the triggers that cause them to occur. Um, so uh, Mike Denver wants to know. And oh, whoops, hold on. I lost it. Here we go. Um, so a lot, a lot of guys in my Discord uh, love to talk about uh, freeze drying their mushrooms. Got, got probably five or six guys that have really fancy uh, the, uh, freeze drying machines and the fruit look amazing. Have you guys done any testing comparing um, short term and long term potency um, and then alkaloid uh, profiles um, it, dehydrating with heat without heat versus uh, freeze drying? I haven't had any customers come in with those specific requests. I've tested freeze dried and, you know, dehydrated, dried, air dried, but not from the same person. So I've never done any direct comparisons of any of that yet. I'd love to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't have any data di to directly answer this question. Okay. Um, but my my thoughts on it are that freeze drying probably preserves more alkaloids, uh, total content. Um, definitely in the, like the immediate analysis, if theorize it's possible that regular conventional drying might be better for long-term storage, um, because you're not actually ru rupturing fungal cell walls. So right. the compounds that are within might have a little more protection and long-term storage. Um, but I don't have anything to back that. It's just kind of, uh, thought I have in my head. And then as far as the manure substrate, producing more alkaloids versus cocoa from the same genetics. Um, it's possible. I also don't have great data to support that. Um, it might be nutrition level and, um, you know, certain cofactor levels in the substrates and uh, maybe right. even bacteria being present to, to co-ferment things and, um, possibly help the mushroom um, biosynthesize some of these molecules. Maybe maybe the bacteria and pasteurized manure substrates are able to break down something and maybe the mushroom is able to take that and uptake it and make something with it. But I, I don't know. 
possible yeah. just putting a bunch of grain or the right level of grain helps. Um, but I have heard that manure is stronger. I, I totally speculation, but <clears throat> my quick answer would be the richer media would probably more likely produce a more potent product. But again, I don't grow mushrooms. I'm just basing it off of like my cannabis knowledge and how richer media usually produce a, unless it's too concentrated, right? Uh, you produce a better product. Yeah, I think it is like a bell curve kind of thing. You get to like yeah. the ideal nutrient content and then it starts to taper off. Sure. It's interesting to think about the, the fungi though, because obviously they're not plants. They're, they're eukaryotes that are more related to us than a yeah. plant. And so uh, the capability that fungi have to, you know, adapt, I think is a lot stronger than a plant. And, you know, if you look at some of the studies done on mushroom mycelia and, you know, you have these giant organisms where you like provide a food at one end and immediately the other end of the, of the, of the uh, organism can deal with it. You know, it's like, there's like a, it's like electrical communication through the organism, which we don't, you know, here Paul Sam is talking about this stuff a lot, which is super interesting. And, you know, the, uh, the natural intelligence of, of fungi. And so to try to figure this stuff out without data, it's, you know, just guessing. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking through the slides here and I did miss uh, one that I thought would be worth pulling up here. Um, Jordan, you want to talk about this uh, Ovia cestata? Yeah, this was something I did this spring. I did a comparative maturity analysis of Psilocybe avoidia cestidiata. Um, I went to a patch that was fruiting near my house and um, I harvested, carefully harvested some mushrooms at a few different maturity states um, from, so the maturity states here are pin, which is that top picture. And mm -hmm. then uh, just that veil break, just past the veil break, um, fully mature, which is that um, picture, the, the bottom left picture, and then sun dried, which was some that had been like exposed to the sun and had started um, crackling and, um, Okay. Basically, they were, what a cool they were like, experiment. They were like ninety percent desiccated in the field, and um, was kind of contrary. I guess this could be added to your surprising results. Yeah. Uh, what was interesting to me is they all tested relatively similar. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not really sure why. I would have, you know, assumed, and I, you know, usually pins are are stronger um, that I've seen in, in monotub grows of cubensis. Um, mm -hmm. so this is some weird data to get back from the ovoids. Um, and certainly more needs to be done, but, um, yeah, that really man, flies in the face of our inconsistency argument, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that, was, in that was, very was, small was, patch too, know, right? No, it's actually a very large patch. I could oh, okay. uh, load some pictures to your discord later, but, um, okay. it was a massive patch, but, um, yeah, you know, all this talk about like mushrooms being super inconsistent. And then there I was. Oh, yeah. I harvested. <clears throat> but the thing is, this well, hey, you know what? Probably... Maybe in nature, they might be a little more consistent than in a in a grow indoors. Who knows? Right. Like maybe they're I mean, a little that... more um, uh, homozygous because they yeah. just, they're not they haven't been bred to be all mm, wonky good point. And crazy. Maybe they're, yeah. you know, naturally selected to be um, a certain way. So. Oh man, you just gave me a, a whole research project idea. Where's that money <laughs> um, we were talking about earlier? <laughs> but guys, um, it, most important that I feel like the data that that we're not talking about here is uh, the value of the sun dried mushroom. It's looking pretty potent. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, sun dried. Very surprising because UV yeah. should degrade the molecules with enough time. However. You think you about see the, the drop in psilocin. Yeah, mm -hmm. you see, um, yeah, that's true. You see the um, the structure of the ah, mushroom. It's kind bit. of like this umbrella, yeah. and um, you know, and it has all this this pigment in the cap, and so the pigment is probably offering Protective. some UV protection. Yeah, um, and right. everything below should you know be protected. So interesting. Uh, it's an that's interesting. A, point. That's a good point. 
Yeah, how cool would it be to like go like maybe this patch? You go and you get some spores and you isolate a clone or do whatever you got to do. I don't know how all that works, but you know, you basically turn this into a a lab variety. And you know, if you know where this patch is, you could go back regularly every year or every season. Oh yeah, and compare each. Yeah, and then so you have longer mm -hmm. you grow it indoors. Is it going to diverge from the natural population in terms of the alkaloid content? That would be super cool. Right, like how many years it takes to start seeing differences. Or, yeah. And then that's um, a whole bunch of money on some basic research that just be, oh, that's cool. <laughs> right? Yeah. Hey, well, how, how do we apply that? Better than some of those money pits that you were talking about earlier. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Man, People. so I always think about that, that we control so many factors in the lab when we're cultivating these mushrooms because we want them to fruit and, and, and whatnot. But out in nature, it's it's in the fucking wild and it's growing wherever it's growing. And, you know, to some degree, those many things have to work together. Spores have to germinate. They have to land in the right spot. They have to form hypho, you know, secondary uh, mycelium. And then all the, you know, moisture and the evaporation and a million things have to work out. Ground temperatures have to be a certain a certain spot. And all these factors have to come together. So, you know, in that way, they're very picky. But then also, we know they're very resistant. They're very uh, vigorous anytime we grab a, a wild fruit. So I always wonder, are they, like, for their species, are they behaving the same way? Or like uh, George sort of talked about, I always think, like these things seem really adaptive it is the, the chemistry that's going on in, in the, in the mycelial networks. Is it different at different times of the, the year? Is it different based on the ground that it's growing in? Is it different based on a bunch of bacteria that might be present in one area and not another? Do all the other alkaloids then change as a result of that? This is just, you know, a trillion things we, I don't think we know. And might not ever know. I think that uh, it is mo most likely my hypothesis would be that they are quite variable. You know, uh, fungi have been on the planet for like a billion years. Yeah. Just think about how much evolution has occurred, allow them to be so plastic and adaptive to their environments. I mean, fungi basically grows everywhere. It's like the yeah. only organism that is in every niche of our planet, you know? So, um, yeah. putting like a limit on the capabilities of them biochemically might be a little short sighted. Um, yeah. you know, there's a, a lot for a long time, fungi were just kind of ignored unless they could be used commercially. Right. Uh, you know, with yeast and brewing and, and bread and, but, you know, to really look into some of these remarkable organisms and see what they're capable of it's only been a thing of academics right or just curious so yeah. the fact that there's a industry developing around um therapeutic fungi hopefully there will be enough money funneled and to the right people to to do the research to figure some of, some of this stuff out because it is absolutely fascinating and and i would love to see you know mycology become more mainstream yeah, I mean, I, I, like, I have to go to either Ann Arbor, Michigan, or I think Youngstown uh, for my nearest uh, herbariums. And uh, if I wanted to even get a degree in mycology, I, I don't know where I would have to go. It's such an understudied uh, branch of the sciences, for sure. Although it seems like that is slowly changing. The interest seems to be growing. Um all right, guys, I, I think we've rounded our two hour point and Jordan might have either went on a bathroom break or. Uh, oh, no, just off camera. Here he is. Um, anyway, I wanted to uh, say we're, we're probably rounding the bend here. Um, if anybody in the live stream had uh, any last questions they wanted to ask, we could do that here real quick. But I think I'm going to. Uh, Thank everybody for coming. Um, hopefully it won't be the last time. I, I feel like we, we can keep talking. As you guys do more testing and we get more results, I think it'd be great to have you guys back periodically and 
talk about what you've been up to and how things are going. Sure. That'd be awesome. I appreciate you having us on and had a great time. Super fun. Thanks to everybody who's watching uh, and stuck around for the whole time. And anybody who's going to be watching in the future, really appreciate you. And uh, thank you, Michael Geeky, for having us on. And thanks, Jordan, for doing this together. It was super fun. Yeah, I had a blast. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. All right, guys. Well, that concludes tonight's episode. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking with the good fun guy. I'm going to be trying a new streaming platform, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, hopefully, it's better. Um, maybe less tricks, but uh, ultimately trying to have a little more, more control over the audio video feed and uh, make a better product in, in the long run. So, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, he's a cool guy. He's a master of bag rows and he's, uh, just, a, a experimenter at his core. So we're going to get into kind of his, his life as a cultivator and, uh, learn a few things. So anyway, uh, thank you, George. Thank you, Jordan. So, uh, in the description on YouTube, I have links to their Instagrams, their websites, if you guys want to link up and uh, find out more about uh, how to actually hire them for HPLC testing, all that information will be in the description. Um, and uh, just again, thank you very much, not just for being on the podcast, but for doing what you're doing, because I, I think you're contributing in a very significant way to uh, elevating the, the ethics and the uh, reputation of the community. So uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Facebook, Instagram, email, website, Discord. I think you'll have it all linked. So all the socials, guys. Yeah. Yep. It, it'll it'll be in there. All right, guys. Take care. Have a good night. Uh, and audience members, thanks for sticking with us. We'll see you next week. Take care.